gods and goddesses. It is time for your second semi-final of the day. Please make some noise for Oni Warriors. And their opponents make some noise for the Atlantis Leviathans. After a wild first half of our day, it is now time to take a deep breath and reset and maybe do it all over again. We move into our second semifinal of the day, also a best of five. This time, Oni Warriors and Atlantis Leviathans going toe to toe. My name is Dolson Mifflin, and inbound here with me to break this one down. Miff, take a deep breath. You, you, you're fresh off the cast of dragons and sticks ferrymen. We, we felt the energy from up here, of course, on the desk. You can exhale now. <laughs> You're welcome. Uh, describe the energy for me of our first semifinal from the caster perspective. I mean, it, it, it is so crazy. It, as a caster, you have to be unbiased, but that, th this crowd is anything but, man. <laughs> it is so wild. I mean, cheering for totems. The, it, it's electric here, man. And clearly, the Jade Dragons deserve every bit of it because that is a wild set. Their fans will be thrilled to know that they get to do it all over again tomorrow. They are guaranteed at least three games in our grand finals, maybe without going down 2-0 first this time. They'll keep things interesting. Our other semifinal, and this is what we're moving into right now. Three teams remain, two of them playing as the Leviathans and the Oni Warriors go toe-to-toe. -to -toe. So inbound, we look at these two teams and the way that they played yesterday. The Leviathans needed a moment to get going, the Oni Warriors shot out of a cannon, it feels like, now face off in a best of five in the semifinals. And I think that Levi set actually spells a little bit of goodness for them, because that first set, you get that first loss out of the way, you get how that feels, second game, go into it, it's a competitive game that you have to compete for, and then the third one, you put it all together and you dominate, start to finish, and that's bringing you into this set against this Warriors team, which, for, for my money, I mean, for everyone's money at the beginning of the year, was dominating the entire league, able to take on anyone. Oni Warriors, this is a team that have made statements with their gameplay over the course of the year here in season 10. Talk about shot out of a cannon, it's the beginning of the year for the Oni Warriors. They have changed up not only their roster, but maybe their play style a little bit. And, and Miff, does it feel more refined now from the Oni Warriors? Maybe a similar mentality, but a bit cleaner in the way that they get it done. They, they still certainly have the ability to play that early game dominant style yep. that the Oni Warriors became so closely associated with throughout the early portions of the year, but the refinement comes in shot calling. And I know Genetics has a lot of detractors here in the crowd after his uh, departure mm -hmm. from the Camelot Kings, but you cannot take away from his absolute ability to see the map from the bird's eye view. It, it's ridiculous the calls that he's willing to make around Gold Furies, Fire Giants, this macro level of play of, well, one guy I just took a back on the right-hand side, so that allows me to move three meters to the left, and, and that's going to secure me an objective. That level of play, that, that nuanced, objective-minded, we don't need to run it down style, that is completely new to the Oni Warriors with their pickup. Curious how some of the nerves might be getting to this Oni Warriors team, because remember, a lot of these players in a similar position last year on the world stage, Genex able to win it, SOT falling a bit short. Some of that has to start to build up here. Hazer, what is your read on this Oni Warriors team? What do they do so well, and what are you hoping to see them do more of today? Um, I think that the different thing we saw from them this event is they almost had a King's-esque play style. They were playing very late game, very objective focused. They were looking to wall off uh, Gold Furies and Pyromancers and play from there. Uh, that's what I want to see them continue to do, but it's going to take a lot for them to slow down the Leviathans in the early game. Leviathan's Dragons finals would be a lot of fun, but so would Dragons and Oni Warriors when you talk about 
all the different ways that things could shake out here. Inbound, you got to look at the opposite side of things here as well. Talk plenty about the Oni Warriors, but the Leviathans, they're a team, of course, have made some roster changes throughout the year this year, and those seem to be paying off, despite, again, maybe a slower start to the weekend, still in a very good spot. Yeah, and the Levi's are the most, I think, exciting team at the tournament from what they're able to do at all points. They are not a team that is looking to go late. They're happy to go late if it does, but they will try to win this game early. And we saw that against the Mambo in that game three where they start dominating early game, they snowball a little bit to a nice mid game, and then their late game is also flawless. My only worry is, is there gonna be some, you know, fight back from the Warriors where they can kind of match them in any spot that the, the Levi's go through? Because if it goes late, Genetics is like that late game guardian mastermind, you know, sets up the map really well. Are the Levi's gonna be able to 5v5 late game against this Warriors comp? And I, I'm glad you bring that up because for me, what makes the Leviathans so strong, and I know it's a bit of a cop-out answer, but it's their drafting phase. They, they've got a multitude of play styles they can go through and they've got a multitude of compositions to match each one of those play styles. It seems to me all of their drafts, barring maybe some of these picks where we see Panda Cat goes towards like ooh or things along those lines, just simply dominate on the field. It, it's so clear it, and it's maybe an exclusive to the Leviathans where you can look at the draft and say, this is what they're aiming for. This is how they want to play, and they always execute on it. One thing that had the crowd really excited in our first semifinal of the day, of course, was the Totem of Ku and the battles over that over in the solo lane. Now it's SOT and Fino K's opportunity to fight over that. Hazer, if you're a player on map right now, are you going a little extra hard for uh, for the Totem over in Solo? Uh, I think it's, it, it could be a little bit of a trap, but yeah, I think so. I think you got to go hard for it. You've got to try and feed off the crowd's energy. I think the Leviathans in particular, a team that would do really, really well based off the crowd's energy. They like to play aggro. They like to get uh, early kills, early objectives, and snowball the game. And I think the crowd being hype will really help with that. And I think that could be part of their strategy today. Hope the crowd has some gas left in their tank after what was a very exciting first semifinal. How about play style-wise inbound? What do you see between SOT and Fine OK? I mean, Osiris, I mean, uh, not Osiris, that's the god I think he's going to play. Solo or Troll on this Osiris <laughs> there you go. is the god that Spoilers. I kind of think of. Yeah, yeah, I kind of gave you guys that answer. But yeah, Osiris for Solo or Troll, it's a god that he kind of has made his name on when I used to team with him. He dominated the map with this character. He ran the early game, ran the mid game, maybe a little frisky in the late game. But when he gets this character, he will play for those totems. He will 1v2, and he will make it look good and on the opposite side. Final will just play whatever he thinks is strong. We, did, we saw an Odin, we saw a little bit of Nike. He's not really willing to just play to just dominate, get those totems, but he team fights far none like one of the best solos in the league. Players over in the solo lane, a lot to fight for. A spot in the finals, of course, the most important, bit more important than that totem. Final K and SOT currently standing by with Kelly for the pregame interview. Everyone, please welcome to the stage Solo or Troll and Fine OK. <laughs> SOT, we saw your team yesterday take down the reigning champs. Clearly, vibes were high right now. But once you left the stage, what was your preparation knowing that you were going to be going up against your, this team? Uh, I mean, I can't give away any strats, but we definitely, you know, the Vitans have definitely been a good team. I think they beat us twice this year so far. I think uh, the last few times we played them, they beat us. So we just want to make sure we're giving our all and, like, not be complacent at all and just give our best pretty much. Now, Final K, obviously yesterday we saw one of the only two-to-one games in our quarterfinals, losing the first game to Hex Mamba, but clearly you guys were able to make a comeback in game three, not even dropping a single kill from the other side. What do you think you learned from that matchup that you're going to be using to go up against this game? I mean, Hex Mangmo is a really strong team, and whenever you come into a LAN, there's always a scrim meta and then the LAN meta, and um, I felt like we learned a lot about the actual LAN meta versus the scrim meta against them, and, uh, you know, props to them. We felt like game one probably should have been what game three was, um, but yeah, we're gonna, we're gonna try and keep that up today. SOT, we heard from the analysts that one of the strong suits from the Leviathans is their drafting phase. Do you agree, and how do you think you're gonna counter that? Uh, yeah, they're pretty good drafters. Um, I can't really give away any strats, but I think um, I think we have, we, have, we have some good drafts in store for them, honestly. So I'm excited. Fine, okay. Any concerns going up against the Oni Warriors? No, I mean, we, we've, we've beaten them twice this year. We think we maybe have their number. I mean, I'm, I, they're obviously a strong team. And uh, 
I played against Sot in the semifinals, or maybe not the semifinals, but last year we played against him in the semifinals, and my team lost two to three, so. <laughs> um, so try and get some revenge on Saad. He's obviously a really good player, so yeah. Well, is that revenge going to happen? We'll find out real soon. But real quick, guys, before I let you go back to your team, is there any final words you have? I just want to say Final K is a great friend and even better competitor. And like last year and the year before that, I will beat him. So I'm excited. Fine, OK. I'm going to invade your blue, bro. All right. The first blue, be ready. All right, let's see what happens, everyone. Guys, get back to your desks, and we're heading back to our analysts. A difference in, in mindset from SOT. Ah, we don't want to reveal any strategies. We can't talk about picks and pins. Fine, now, I'm going to invade your first blue buff. Just, the first just, be, one. <laughs> just be ready. And now, it, look, for me, it's playing mind games. Is he actually going to do it? Is it? Is well, he's going to do it. No, he's, he's not. He's, he's going to do it. He's not going to do it. You can't call your shot and then not follow it up. He's just, just it's did. the mental game. The game's already started. This is the mental portion. He's gonna, Solo's <laughs> going to be thinking about it, like Dilson said. And, and SOT sets the stage quite nicely for that solo lane matchup. These are two players that have played against one another in very important matchups for a few years in a row now. And, and so it's just a great story continuation that they now face one another in the semifinals once again. Without further ado, picks and bans for game one between the Leviathans and the Oni Warriors. Hazer, what are some things you key in on as these first bands and first picks unfold? I'm interested to see what the Oni Warriors oh, no. have in store in terms of the jungle. There was an Awelix uh, picked up, I think, every single game by adapting and the Leviathans last time out, so we'll see what they have there. Can the cat play Blink Artemis? Maybe, do they have a counter to that? I'm not sure if the Blink Art is gonna be the answer to the duo lane here for the Leviathans. Yeah, uh, hopefully, hopefully we don't see a Blink Artemis, and if we do, may maybe, hopefully way later. But starting with these bands, I, I want to see a focus more on the jungle. I, I think that is something that I'm really thinking about between these two teams. Panatom, been one of the best junglers for a while now. The Maman, the Awilix, Awilix already gone. A, a few gods that are really sticking out. Camazelt's already, there is two now two bands into the jungle, and Maman is the only like kind of power pick left available. And is there going to be pry on the Maman compared to the other games? We'll see. It's hard to say, but even with all these jungle bans already, it's hard to say that Panatom's God Pool is even being challenged. I'm going to things like Rat and Thor as some of his favorite go-tos. So still certainly a lot of picks still for both junglers. I mean, e even adapting on the other side has a few flavor picks available. I, I do imagine Maman Brigitte at least peeks her head into P's and V's. I think the performance we've seen from that God just this weekend alone has justified seeing her on the world stage. But instead, crazy. Wow, this high up in the draft. Yeah, super high prio Odin once again from Solo Air Troll. He seems to really like this pick. Afro to pair alongside it. Last time we saw Odin, we saw it paired with a Yamoja. They had the cage and the walls, two different ways to force the Phantom Shell. This time, the Odin likely going to have to do it himself. So a Phantom Shell will really counter him up in this game. And it's interesting to see that Sobek Ganesh kind of dictated the last best of five. And going into this best of five, there is no Prya on it. We get an Afro support and most likely a Baron support, which is an interesting matchup because Baron, for, for, for the most part, can pull an Afro at most points. She has to get almost four points into that ult to really be able to live it. Otherwise, she's going to have to go something like beads. And that way, you're still locking them down for easy Thoth set up, or even to a certain extent, the Hachiman. I, I, I like exactly what the Leviathans have got. It seems to me it's going to be a first target we see, pull them in, absolutely eviscerate them style draft. Yeah, super interesting. We saw this Baron as a counter to more the Yamoja, but it's the same idea with the Odin. When the Odin cage goes up and he tries to disengage, you pull him back through his own cage with the Baron Sambiel call. Didn't really work out last time for the Leviath for the, the Kings rather in the same matchup against the Warriors. We'll see if the Leviathans can execute better. And with a little bit of that, the potential there is still with the Odin. There, the, the emoji gave a lot of appeal to this Odin. So now in a matchup that doesn't have a ton of appeal with this Odin, you expect the Afro to be linked to more of those hyper carries, that Tiamat, the Hunter, whatever uh, Panatom ends up playing. So Solo Troll is going to have to be a little bit more careful than we saw the last Odin versus Baron. You know, with the last few bands available, I wonder if we see a few more jungle prio bands. I'm thinking of things like the Thor again. Susano comes to mind as nice. well. Oni Warriors will take away that Thor. I thought it'd be onus on the Leviathans to do it themselves instead. I, I suppose the Warriors have been watching a lot of OG Smite know that adapting on Thor is just a little bit different on the world stage. Jungle matchup, one for the ages. Adapting v Panatom. 
two of the most talented to ever do it. You won't get your Osiris solo inbound, I'm sorry to say. We won't be getting Thor for adapting. Gilgamesh also taken away. We begin again with the calls for Totem, this time more directed towards Fine OK. Uh, Hazer with what's still needed and what's left open. What are some things you'd like to see here in the final four? For the only Warriors, I think I'd be looking at my Hunter pick. Uh, Natrioid does tend to go towards the same picks most of the time in this spot. For most teams, we've seen like the Ishtar, maybe the Shibalanke could come out for the Warriors one more time. I think that's what I'd be looking at if I were them. It's great for those team fights. I almost want to see net locked in that Izanami. We saw it banned yesterday. That tainted Izanami is pretty strong when she is getting backline because those extra protections, the survivability from Aphrodite. This is the Oni Warriors comp, the Oni Warriors dual lane that they always opt for. Aphrodite Izanami, guaranteed laning phase pressure, guaranteed strong late game, and just very strong at all points. And creating that side lane pressure can alleviate some of the pressure we're likely to see up against this Odin. Great in the team fight is the Odin. Phenomenal at locking down individual targets or stopping Hachiman in his tracks, but not exactly a, a lane bully. So anything that can drag attention over towards Duo, I think favors the Warriors. And, and I love this Susano pick. It is so good into what the Levi's have. Immense chase potential into the Thoth, the Hachiman, and could pretty freely avoid a lot of a Baron's abilities with those two dashes. So I absolutely love this pick by Panaton. Yeah, I really like the jet stream here. We'll be able to follow Thoth through the dash. We'll be able to follow the Hachiman ult as well. We've seen a couple of great Susano performances this event so far, particularly out of April. But now, a Cerberus hover. Have we finally got a Guardian in the solo lane? Or is this a mage solo? Could the Baron be flexed? Yeah, what do you think, Bobby? I know you've played a good bit of Cerberus in your time. What, what is it about this pick that, that really attracts them to it? I mean, first off, Tainted is super strong right now. If Guardians or if Warriors weren't as strong as they were, I think we would maybe see a potential Guardians there. I expect Serb in solo. I think this is just a death match for Baron. If he goes to that solo lane, he's just going to get caged, ganked, and killed. But Baron or Serb is able to live this a little bit. And in the late game potential into the Aphrodite, into this Tiamat, there's really easy just play for this Levi's, play for beads, get those beads out, and then punish them. Love ease of play, and I think the Leviathan's absolutely got it. I mean, talk about threat on beads. Cerberus, Stygian Torment, just gonna grab every bit of beads. Fear No Weevil gonna do the exact same thing. If anybody's got any sort of safety it's left over, if they hadn't already died to that onslaught of CC, Baron Somdi as a scalpel can drag them in and make it easy for that Thoth. The amount of Ishtar games slowly starting to build up here. 40% win rate, however, across the five games we've seen. And this Ishtar should kind of do what that Izanami was meant to do. It's going to dominate lane, will play well into the late game. I think you go for this Ishtar because, as you said, so many beads pulls potential on this Levi's. Just getting that extra CC immunity in that Ishtar ultimate. A little bit of extra safety. Don't have to have the Aphrodite always on top of you, always kiss you. You can have her with someone else. So I like that the little switch up there, potential for Izanami, but I like the safety more than I like that little extra pressure. And Ishtar also has a decent interaction into Cerberus in that you can utilize that dash to avoid the ultimate so long as you're willing to go in a bit more aggressive. So another answer to a lot of that CC, great pressure, good scaling into the late game. And it's gonna help you out around those objectives, which is generally one of the weaknesses of Tiamat is the ability to either DPS or secure an objective. DPS from Ishtar, maybe not so much the secure. Yeah, this Leviathan's comp I'm looking at, the CC is unbelievable. Hunbat's ult, Baron ult, Serb ult, Toth 2 pretty powerful. Hachiman has the slow on his ult, has the stun on his 3. Feels like they have an embarrassment of riches here in terms of CC. And it's going to be real, real difficult for the Warriors to stay safe. The beads, when the beads are down, the Afro has to be linked to the right target. And SOT might have to pick up a pair of beads of his own. Yeah, and I think that worries me on the Oni Warriors side. You don't match that beats pull potential. You don't have that same, I mean, I, I hate keep bragging on that ease of play that the Levi's have. It's difficult to play a comp like this Warriors. Odin Cage, not really pulling relics, maybe a phantom shell. Susano's really just pulling Aegis. And outside of that, Aphrodite is a single target, just kiss, and that's about it. So a little worried when we get to these late game fights, what's gonna be the in, the go button for the Warriors? Are they just running it down, trying to win the fight like that? If you're running into this Atlantis Levi's comp, that's, that's not going to be good. I mean, the go button's got to be just put the ring around the Thoth and pray that you've got the damage behind it, right? I oh. mean, it, it's it's hard to say easy because Phantom Shell's going to be there and Odin Ring now has some interactability. You can auto-attack it to get rid of it. But uh, as far as I'm concerned, giant circles on giant circles have an Ishtar to follow up. I, I think the team fight of the Oni Warriors can stand up in the late game. I actually kind of feel like the Odin ult 
Is it good for trapping people in and killing them here? I feel like it might be used more as a zoning tool in this situation. We've seen the only warriors do it in the previous game where they use the Yamoja walls in particular to deny access to objectives. Pyromancer, Gold Fury, they wall them off and they do them quickly. I think that's the way they're going to use this cage. Because if they drop the cage on top of the uh, on top of the Thoth, rather, what is their follow-up? Have you got a Tiamat jumping in there, putting herself in danger? I don't think so. Is the Susanna able to follow up? I think a well-timed Aegis counters that out completely. So I think this Odin cage would be better served in this game as a deterrent for coming into fights rather than a trap on the enemy characters. And before we even get to that late game, looking at the laning phase, the Warriors have that. They have it. They're having a lot of yeah. pressure in solo, a lot of pressure in duo. Jungle, maybe a little 50-50. Hunbots doesn't want to get too involved till five. Susano may be some semblance of pressure, but still wants to wait for that five. And I think if the, if the Warriors can get off to a nice little run, kind of get a, a potential of the Susano Afro just tracking through the jungle, trying to find a pick, that's not going to be easy shut down. Aphrodite pairs very, very well, and, and she survives very, very well through the CC. And she has good damage paired with a lot of the, the carry characters with the Warriors. So be interesting if they can get that lead, will they be able to snowball it? I agree with your point, Hazer, that, that Odin Cage can really be used to zone out around these Fire Giants, Gold Furies, but what are you creating space for? It's not as if there's an entire composition built with the express purpose of dealing with those objectives quickly. Mm -hmm. and that, that opportunity arises maybe at the absolute latest portions of the game if we're looking at a, a Demon Blade, Deathbringer, Ishtar, but until then, you've got relatively low DPS mid. Susano's okay on objectives, but more so for the secure of his ultimate. He's not exactly a burner. I can see the only warriors finding opportunities to look at gold or finding a pick early on, and then in a 5v4 saying, well, we just didn't have enough damage fast enough to grab it. Yeah, Ishtar's DPS is going to be everything they rely on, really. It does have good damage on objectives, but it is just her. Tiamat's damage, pretty disappointing. The zone control of that Tiamat ult, really her powerful option around objectives. One other thing I'd like to touch on here is Leviathans have switched gear, I feel like, from what we saw from them previously. Previously, it was early pressure. They wanted to control the map. And, and this comp, it feels like it's gone the opposite way. Thoth, Baron, Curb, Hunbats, all very, very late game oriented gods in my mind. Uh, and I'm wondering if we're seeing like a different play style. We're seeing Leviathan show, look, you saw we could do the early game stuff. Now watch us go late. And it's curious that they opt to do it into the Warriors, a team that we expect to kind of play that more early game, run it down type of style. But if, I mean, if they can mitigate an Oni Warriors early game and play towards that late game, I mean, that, that shows that they can play this early game style and that late game style, which bodes really well in a best of five, because it gives you that opportunity to show which one do you think we're going to play? Are we going to play for early or are we going to play for late? You open your mouth. thought you had some thoughts here, Myth. I'm curious now, because we, we picked apart these compositions pretty heavily here, fellas. When, when you look at players on either team that you're hoping to really get off to a good start, who comes to mind for you, Mifflin? Someone that you want to have start to build momentum for themselves and for their team in game number one. Tend to default towards the jungle, and that's okay if that's your answer. <laughs> it breaks my heart. It for sure. It, it, it breaks my heart that I can't say it, Bobby, because it feels like Dual lane pressure, or side lane pressure rather, has been just the absolute dominant factor in the meta right now. And then otherwise, it's, it's late game transition mages. I, I've been loving what I've seen from the standard mages out of mid, so facilitating mid laners on both sides, high priority in my mind. Yeah, and, and I guess with those side lanes, you also get that mid lane kind of late game because you get to farm up more, more mana, you get to be used. And w when you have that side lane pressure, shield buffs, totems, yeah cooldown camps. This is a way to snowball. We've seen actually solo laners get like two level leads and then they rotate and they just wreak havoc at these gold periods. So I agree, maybe not junglers in this game are the most important. It might be those side lanes. Yeah, yeah. I think solo lane in particular could come into this. We've seen early teleport upgrades, particularly in the last set and teams rotating over towards the duo side of the map, rotating that solo laner over early and opening up opportunities for picks, opportunities for gold furies. And I think that could be a really important factor here, especially if that Odin can rotate over before the Phantom Shell is available. There will doubtless be one in this game, but it won't come online until maybe level 10, level 12. We shall see. And I think the Odin can find some impact before that if he picks up a teleport upgrade early. Appreciate everyone hanging with us. We'll be getting into game one here uh, just around the corner between the Oni Warriors and the Atlantis Leviathans. All right, it's that time. Game number one between the Oni Warriors and the Atlantis Leviathan starts right now. Thank you so much. Over on the desk, it's J-Mac and Charlie here to bring the start of our second semifinal here at the SWC between the Leviathans and the Oni Wars, and should be an exciting matchup, Charlie. You look back at the history of this team, all of phase one, it's a dominant Oni Warriors. They're getting win after win after against 
every team they come to. But then we get into phase number two. A change comes to the only Warriors team, which is bringing genetics here in place of Jay. Some changes on the Leviathan side as well, bringing Panda Cat onto the roster. And all of a sudden, the story flips a bit. Now we have the Leviathans winning out in their matchups against the Oni Warriors. I mean, it's going to be an intense one, Jay Mac. You can tell the crowd is excited for it, and these semifinals have already delivered so much. And I know the crowd is excited, but we will have to go to a break for just a moment for a small tag issue. When we get back, we'll have you game number one of our semi. Kill the game, but Panda Cat gonna go for the top kill on the cyclone spin. Jump on top and one more wow. hit and shows them who the king of the lane is. It's Panda Cat all day. Uh, fuck Panda Cat. I love Maxime. Uh, I think Panda Cat is. Uh... I've played so many scrims against him, so many competitive games against him. He is just uh, a super consistent ADC. He will take the take any fight you give him, and most of the time he'll win them. Um, and I think having somebody so confident and so mechanically like gifted, I think that's a really nice thing to have on your team. Somebody you can always count on to just pump out the damage. Panda to me is like the epitome of confident player like i think you can tell playing against panda that he doesn't back down from a fight he's never scared of another team he's never too low or too high on his teammates i think he's just always a very confident confident steady consistent performer i think that he's been a presence that that team really needed to kind of get them out of the slump and yeah i mean there's not too much bad to say about panda i just think he's he's one of the best adcs to ever touch the game after playing with him for years, um, I'll always consider him a top three, but even like sometimes he'll just be the best ADC um, in the league all the time until he stops playing Smite. Yeah, no, I like Panda Cat a lot in real life. I knew him since he was a kid. He was like 15, 16. I knew him, I met him in real life at, at that age. And I think he's grown a lot as a person. He's, he's a lot more mature now. Uh, He's a lot more level-headed, like has a good head about him. And um, so, yeah, I really have nothing for love, nothing but love for him in real life. In game, he's my son as well. You know, we always, that's the thing about us ADCs. We all call each other, you know, our sons or just talking smack. Um, but yeah, I, I always want to play a little bit better when I play against him for sure. Um, I want to see him suffer in the battlegrounds, on the battlegrounds, you know what I mean? But yeah, no, I think he's a great player. He came back. My first game back, I think I went 0-8 on all in i was like dang like okay uh but yeah no he his first game back i think he played like rama and he and he popped off and i was just like you know damn like okay maybe i was the problem <laughs> right he just like he just wears his emotions on his sleeve you know you can tell exactly what that guy is thinking about the way he's playing the way he's his team is playing the way the meta is like you can listen to him on a stream or read a tweet from him and you know exactly what that guy is thinking he's been like my best friend as far as like anyone in SPL is concerned. In fact, probably just like my best friend in general, because I don't really have friends. If I if I win Worlds, like he's somebody, like probably the only one person that I'd want to win with, you know? Like if I had we'll to choose one person, like you got to win with this guy, then yeah, I'd probably choose Max. We're so. winning. What a W video, so cute. Yeah, no, I like Panda Cat a lot in real life. I knew him since he was a kid. He was like 15. <laughs> <laughs> let me hit pause real quick. Let me let me run it back. Since I was a what? Dude. Yeah. I think he's grown a lot as a person. How do you react to the accusations that that man raised you? <laughs> what? <laughs> Uh, where are these accusations coming from exactly? From the video. From, from the Zapman video? Mm. Um, let's just say as you get old, you know, you start to uh, misremember things, a little bit of a delusion kicks in, Alzheimer's, things like that. So um, we'll just, we'll let, it, we'll let it play out. Sure, Steven raised me, but as all good things come to an end, the sensei has, or no wait, the Padawan has overtaken the sensei.
You always gotta love the energy that our players provide here in the SPL. We're back now in semi up to number two of the SWC, back in game number one, just about ready to kick off here between the Leviathans and the Oni Warriors. And I'm imagining sparks flying in this match, Trelly. Yep, and that's exactly what we wanna see, right? We wanna see action packs, smite the Leviathans taking on the Oni Warriors. This has been a rivalry built up for quite some time. They've been at the top end of the standings throughout the entirety of this season. And now, no better place for them to see each other than the semifinals. I mean, even pulling from that pregame interview, you hear what SOT says. This is two years now that yeah. we've met at Worlds, and I've knocked you down trying to go for three in a row. We'll see if Sot and the Oni Warriors can do that. Game number one between the Leviathans and the Oni Warriors here in the semifinals of SWC ready to kick off. We'll see who puts their best foot forward here in game number one of our best of five. Of course, this guy goes right back to the hot dog going, why wouldn't he? It's essentially patented for this man at this point. Yeah, one thing I want to zoom in on is Fine OK on the Cerberus. This is a pick I alluded to for quite some time when the Apro came back. You know, I was like, the healing, the Cerberus should have a decent matchup into compositions like this, but no one was taking the bait, J-Mac. No one thought that Cerberus could hang in lane, and I tend to agree, right? The CC that interrupts that ghastly breath can make for quite an annoying early game, and then you lose blue buffs, and then you fall behind. But Fine, okay, seems to think this is the matchup to bring it out. And I got to echo what Hazer said, a disgusting amount of CC here for the Levi's. I mean, you look at all the AOE more than anything, you know, a bunch of single target CC, that's one thing, but big circle followed by big circle followed by a giant cone. There's just so much Leviathans have pressure-wise against the purification beads that I got to imagine almost every Oni warrior is going to want to pick up. But then there's also that potential threat around the Odin cage. Talk about when Odin comes into the battleground, when Yamojis are out there, how important is getting Phantom Shell? How early do you rush an item like that? For Wrong Yu, he's going to go towards that shell immediately. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it does seem to be something you have to watch out for when the majority of your team is going to have trouble with that cage, right? Ronnie Pandacat and Shinto all have to watch out for the positioning of SOT. They have to watch out for how quickly he upgrades that teleport and makes his fight known. But something to note, the blink Odin cage is usually the call, right? That is the, the engage. If you see an Odin jumping towards you, you dash away. The blink needs to come through. But when you have to deal with Hunbat's ult, Stingy and Torment from Fine OK, wrong you with, with Life of the Party, beads might be something on SOT's mind. You can't hope that Genetic saves you from every single one, right? He's going to be with Panatop. He's going to be with Pagwan. He's going to be with Net. I don't think Sock can count on those Afro ults. Because of that, you know, with SOT maybe having to rely on those beads a little bit more because of that threat of CC, what does that do for the Oni Warriors in team fights? Does that now kind of maybe force the Susana to be a bit more the engager, or does that still fall to SOT even having to go something like beats? I mean, I, you do want the Odin Cage as your first engage unless Panatom's just sitting around a corner and finds a beautiful pull, but the Odin Cage starts off as, hey, we're killing with the cage, right? We are going with this big ring of spears and we're gonna follow up for it. Later on in the game, it just becomes, hey, I'm gonna force dashes, I'm gonna force relics, and then Panatom needs to get to the back line. And we can't gloss over the performance that Pagon had in his quarterfinals match on this Tiamat. He was able to do so much damage, and a meta where really not too many are looking towards this Tiamat. If he gets online, he can just absolutely destroy a team play. Wrong you, bailing out Panda Cat, some good damage from Netroid and Genetics. And this combo, the Aphrodite, and it felt like for a while, Aphrodite, the god to go to for the longest time. And then kind of fell off for a little bit, and now starting to see that rise back up with these supports. Maybe not quite the level of priority. The fans know exactly what they want, Battle of Totem. I'll go 1-1 one, one at least for now. But going back to this Aphrodite pick, more than anything, I, I think we always talk about having that hyper carry to tag along with at the end of the game. You know, once you hit those level 20s, feels like Panatom on a Susana is the perfect pick. Yeah, that, that is the exact pick you want, right? You, you want a, a jungler who can hard carry Panatom on a pick that can do the exact same thing. But Susano, you know, the, the, the excuse is, hey, he's got so much ease of CC, right? You do not want to get Susano locked down. Adapting can do it. Final K can do it. Wrong, you can do it. That link is going to prepare all of that, right? Undying Love is going to make sure that Panatom can go as deep as he wants. He can go forward. He can do all of that DPS. And that's why the Sony Warriors comp can work if in the right hands, but Leviathans, they didn't know if they wanted to go for a blue buff invade or not, and adapting, already taking a lot of damage. Bird Bomb starting to chunk at the Hunt Bats, but fine, okay, makes the wise play, recognizes my jungler's taking a bit too much damage, we're going to go ahead and pull this blue buff all the way back to tier one, so by the time that Panatom and Sock rotate over, it's already missing, and they're not going to dig oh, man. that deep in to try and take that blue buff away. Final case secures the totem while clearing out some of the minion wave as well. And we'll be keeping our eyes on this Cerberus a lot because this is not a very common god. I think this is actually our first 
uh, Guardian coming over into the solo lane this entire event. Yeah, it's gonna take a while before Final K has some damage online. I wouldn't doubt a Stone of Binding or some more DPS coming through later on in the build, but for now, you just want to survive. And Sot should be stunning out that Ghastly Breath. That's why Final K likely just maxes the spit. It's gonna do more damage anyways. You don't want to deal with that too. It's not gonna work. So I can see why he's putting some more presence into that first ability, but those stuns can absolutely chunk later on. When this Cerberus rotates out, you gotta watch Pagan, you gotta watch Genetics, and especially Panatom. You get a nice stun onto a Susana that can change the way a fight even goes. But now that we have level fives on both these junglers, is there a lane that maybe seems more favorable for one side to go to the other? Does Adapting want to try and get some focus towards solo lane? Does he want to go over to the dual lane and try and get wrong? You Panda Cat ahead. And then on the flip side, where does Panaton put his priority in this jungle spot? I mean, Adapting has the blink, man. The duo lane doesn't look terrible, but it's just not as if you're going to have the free engage. There's still so many beads available, and it's not going to be able to just be the free fear no evil into a kill. But I think solo lane, this is where a lot of these junglers like to go. And already you can see Adapting hovering wants to see if a jump happens it did right there good chain into a pull underneath the tower but looks like this was spotted out immediately so t gets just close enough to the tier one tower to guarantee his safe to a panatom rotating over to this cooldown buff two versus two for the buff could spell a battle brewing at the very least panatom pulls back adapting Final K gonna oh, get a stun done. over the wall. Fear no evil's there. Stingy and torment. a quick beads to try and pull it back right through the Odin cage. Adapting TP's back in. No Odin pulls two under the tower. He's and Sunday get gets one. Oh, Panatom gets the other. It's first blood in the pop-up from Panatom for the Warriors. That is ridiculous. They had such a good stun. Final K absolutely popped off, but too close to the tower. Panatom makes the pull. And what was that? Six HP? We shot Doug. Shout out to the zoom in because that was ridiculous. You cannot dive the tower like that, especially with the Odin Cage, especially with the Typhoon. I thought the early beads might have been what cost him, but no, Panatom lives to see another day. Yeah, but I thought that the stars had aligned for Final King, adapting a perfect spacing of the beads from those AoE CCs, but they didn't account for the pull being back offline, or back off of cooldown, I should say. For Panatom makes a great double pull under that tower, turns the tides entirely, and, and looking at least at the lead that developed from there, it was nearly dead even going into this. Now it's over a thousand gold up for the Warriors. And not only that, it's gonna start a chain effect, right? You know that Panatom's gonna come back to that blue buff. He's gonna come back to Solo and he said, hey, you're behind now, we are ahead. Not, this was not one kill. Both Panatom and SOT got a kill, so now they're both ahead. And now Final Case have to play back. And that's unfortunate because it was a beautiful stun through the wall, connects, get the beads, but just a little bit of an overcommitment and a beautiful play from Panatom and Sot. At the very least, they do know that there is a set of beads down on Panatom, so an opportunity at the very least right. for Adapting to go back to maybe team up with Shinto, try and get some big damage and maybe a big burst follow-up from this Thoth in the mid lane. Yeah, and I, that's something to consider as well. Shinto sitting back. I mean, both of these mid laners. Pan Pagan wants to chill, but Tiamat does not come out swinging. I think Thoth has some kill potential once you get level five, but Tiamat's like, Okay, cool. I got a tornado and some lizards, right? You're gonna you're gonna dial it back. You're gonna chill until late game, until you can get that book of boss stacked up, until you can get some more itemization. I think that's the call, anyways. These mid laners just like to prioritize farm and say, "Dude, don't fight. Like, do not ask for my rotation. I don't want to leave mid lane." Just a side note, that might have been the wildest sign I've seen so far this weekend. I didn't even read it, man. I'm locked in. Yeah, you're locked into this game. I was looking at the screen and I saw a weird sign. I'm like, you know what? More power to you. But now for the Leviathans, what's kind of their reset point? Is this sit back? Is this kind of wait until adapting gets that ultimate back up? Who needs to kind of make that impact to try and pull this team back in from this deficit? I mean, I do not want to see adapting not throw ultimates out anymore. I don't want to see Final K not looking for those stingy and torments because, that, again, that was a great play from them. It's just so thin margins, like six damage. It could have gone either way. So if they're able to reset and still look for Panatom, remember his beads are down. Sot does not have access to beads. I, I don't think they have to give up. But one more death and solo lane's done for. Adapting goes to the other side of the map. It says, fine, okay, you chill. Like, I, I'm going to leave you and help out Duo and look elsewhere because you really do not want to give Panatom another kill, right? Once that Susano gets ahead, it gets real rough. We don't want to let the Susano get too far ahead. Already 1-0-1 one, one for both Panatom and for Solo or Troll here on the side of the Oni Warriors. Apologies for the delay. We're going to try and get back to the game as quick as, quick as we can here between the Leviathans and the Oni I Warriors. I with that. Buff the totem. I'm with that. I'm 100% I'm in favor of this. Where, do we have a dev in the building that can just do that like right now? I'm sure that they can hear you, man. There's plenty of devs in the building. I mean, no, I'm talking like to buff it like oh, right like now. Oh, like in the middle of the game. Like do it now. I don't think that's possible. 
some point. Maybe in between games? I don't know. We'll figure out something. The crowd would want that for sure. I, I know the crowd's all about the totem yeah. of anything. But Leviathan's the Warriors game number one here in this best of five. And again, this is a, a matchup, at least as far as phase two onward has concerned. Yep. This has not been a match that's been really clean by either team. Sure, the Leviathans have won in both these, but it's been a four-game set, a five-game set that's gone between these one. The most recent of those being in that playoffs to get the Leviathans to be able to fight against it was the Sticks Ferryman whenever it was that grand finals matchup there. So a lot of history between these two teams and a lot of the players on here. But we are going to cut it to a quick break. When we come back, we will return the action in game one.
Welcome back to my fans. Apologies for the delay. We got a small update as to what's been going on. You know, everybody gets a little passionate in these venues sometimes. Yep. You know, the fans, the players, the folks at home, everybody's so energized this. But sometimes you get a little too excited, a little too passionate. Unfortunate, the headsets that the J Dragons had used is what was causing a little bit of the issues, but we should be good to go right back in now to game number one between the Leviathans and the Warriors. We tune right back in to Shinto already having to fight for his life at a green buff invade from Genetics and Panatom now put Shinto near death's door. And that might just be the opening call for the Warriors to continue their trend on the left side and invade towards purple buff Panda Cat. Able to dash away in time, but a buff stolen away by the Warriors. So let's dial back in time in case you missed a little bit of that before the break. Uh, beads went down, Panatom close to death, six HP. Those are still down for 100 seconds. I said adapting is a pretty good target, but Fear No Evil not quite off cooldown just yet. The right side of the map looking real clean for the Oni Warriors. You get a kill on Asat, you get a kill on to Panatom. And that's the best way you could start this game, right? Panatom is a jungler who can control the map if given just a small lead. But it's adapting on the world stage. He's got to get a little bit of a buff, right? Sure, a little overextension, but it was such thin margins. And now the right side of the map is where all the action is. Adapting and Panatom both circling around where the Fire Giant will eventually spawn in. I still think Solo is where the sparks will fly. I don't think they realize that the two of them were there, you know, walking right by each other within the jungle. But with this lead, with these two kills that the Oni Warriors got earlier on, and that's now about a 1,500 gold lead that's going the way of the Oni Warriors. And with that kill, has also given a bit of that XP over to SOT. He's now been able to take four of the six totems that have spawned up so far. And that extra little bit of gold, that experience always starts to really stack up. No, it has nothing to do with that. It's the crowd is on your side. The more totems you get, the more they will cheer. And at the moment, the Oni Warriors have double. So Final K is going to have to step it up on the right side of the map. But this is what I was talking about. This is what happens when you get first blooded, or at the very least, adapting and Final K. We're both in that conversation. You lose that presence. You can't step up. But look at this. We got a little bit of a pullback here, trying to grab the ultimate. Trying to pull two. It does, man. To get the stun on Panatom and a few to Evil against the wall. It's adapting to strike back for the Leviathans. Genetic and Netro are teaming up. That's the double ult from Net, but not going to get anything more beyond there. Ultimate forced away from Genetics during all of that. And with those beads still down, an easy pick against Panatom. I mean, what a beautiful chain CC. And this is what I was talking about. Look, five seconds before Panatom's beads were back up. It did eventually come back. Fine, okay. Can rest easy. That pair Paralyzing spit that he hit over two minutes ago ended up paying off. It was just not for the first blood they were looking for. So with the Leviathans able to find their strike back, with Sod able to grab another totem and now leads back over to the dual lane. Wrong Yu gets the heal, gets the extra boost of speed to be able to escape the clutches of Netroid and Genetics. But remember, no ultimate for either supports. Panatom gets his up in just a couple of seconds. Jetstream in, he pulls back Wrong Yu. The shell gets forced away, but it's adapting on the backside. Still no fear, no evil available to him but just showing presence to keep the Oni Warriors away. Yeah, that kiss will be enough to stop the engagement for now, but that just goes to show. Look at these invades, man. Purple buff is not safe. Blue buffs are not safe. They are willing to fight just about anywhere. The Oni Warriors still do have a small lead, but adapting showing. Once those relics are down, he has no problem being able to find a return kill, and not to mention Wrong Yu just chaining that CC together. Wrap it up into life of the party. is going to outlast that undying love that Genetics has. There's plenty of ways you can outplay it as well. You can sort of juke around in the coffin and not let him get that stun, and then you can still find the CC. We talked about it on the desk, and we're gonna keep hammering it home. The CC is what the Leviathans are looking for. You gotta hold on to those beads. Anytime you can pull those beads away for Leviathans, that's a win. It's a much longer cooldown than any CC. That's available on the side of the Leviathans. SOT still garnering about that one level lead over Final K on the soul lane, but in response, even with the kill that Panatom got, that answer back from adapting on the left side has now put the jungle slightly ahead, and more so, goose eggs for the mid laners, but it's Shinto who's benefiting from it. Hits that level 12 before Pagon on the thaw. I mean, yeah, if you, if you use a and punish to farm, which is something that can be risky if you don't know where Panatom is, if you don't know where the enemies are hiding, you can farm extremely fast, and that's the thing. Pagon cannot step forward. He does not have the range to step up to Shinto. That's gonna just be easy to poke him out. Tiamat is never really going to be able to close that gap until much, much later on in the game. Final K trying to force out something for the cooldown buff, but not going to happen. Stingy and Torment, though, losing that could be a great tool for Panatom to get aggressive. I wouldn't be surprised if he spent a little bit more time on the right side of the map. Yeah, unfortunate for Final K, Sop bounces off the side wall, so it doesn't even get as far back as Final K may have wanted. But with that ultimate down, it does give the opportunity to Panatom, maybe a rotation 
from the Oni Warriors to try and get some more pressure for SOT. Keep trying to push that lead where they've got it. Because outside of the solo lane, it's more so in favor of the Leviathan as far as experience is concerned. We already talked about adapting, how Shinto's a bit ahead of Pagon right now. The gold still favoring the Oni Warriors, but that XP is starting to push the Leviathan. And look at this. This is something that Rong you did very early on, right? He upgraded that Phantom Shell. I thought a bit premature, right? So it's not going to rotate out at level 7. You wouldn't be able to do that. But SOT upgraded that Persistent Teleport just about as early as you can, right? As early as you can put some gold into your relics, he has done so. So the Leviathans know at any given moment an Odin Cage could just be behind them. If they don't have their ward coverage, if they don't have the sentries down, it could be trouble. So keep your eyes on Sot. No matter where he is on the map, he could just show up over in duo lane. I think Adapting Man stole that entire camp away from Panatom as well. Brief pause in the action here between the Leviathans and the Warriors. Still in game number one for these guys. 2-1. Leads the kills for the Oni Warriors. The gold still in their favor. Experience, though, dipping the way of the Leviathans. And with beads back up and online for everybody now, it's not going to be as easy to try and go for one of these kills. you got to try and force that relic out early. Would love to see Adapting be able to get a little bit more active. Already seen a bit of action from him once in the solo, once over at the Gold Fury Pit. But now it's time now he's got that Yon's Wrath online, really start hammering those ultimates. As a jungler, you don't want to be the one forcing the relics, right? You want to be the one who's benefiting from the relics that are already forced. Fear no evil just to get beads doesn't feel quite as good as, hey, his beads are down, I'm getting a kill because of fear no evil. But adapting, always a team player, and doesn't mind just sending those out, and maybe fine, okay, can benefit it. Or more specifically, wrong you. That's the combo we saw that got their first kill in the action. That, that Baron Somity ult can also open up some doors there. So just pay attention. The beads, as you said, all up at the moment, so there's no real action, but one mistake, one misclick, or just one hard CC, and that just opens up the door for the Leviathans. It was actually a misspeak on my part. It's not even the Jotun's Wrath early for adapting. He's gone for anti-heal, Brawler's yep. Beat Stick in pocket, so lacking the CDR, but trying to focus on the healing aspect of this team, try and keep this Aphrodite shut down, and not let those six HP targets maybe walk away as the game goes a little bit later. Yeah, I mean, the healing's gonna add up. We talked about that earlier on the desk, even highlighted that the Aphrodite, that's a stain. Yeah, it has to be dealt with. You can't just let someone spam Lovebirds and get the whole team back healed up. But Brawler's beat sick feels so bad on Hunbats, man. You you want that 20% CDR. Yeah. You want once you get Hydra, you're like, okay, I'm good. One of the longer cooldowns in the jungle, and you can just get it up as quickly as possible. But foregoing it means those ults, you can't just throw them out freely. They have to count. Well, we'll have to see what can pans out more than anything here. Small technical issue this time with uh, communication between some of the players out here. So we're trying to get that one fixed up as quick as we can in game one here between the Leviathans and the Oni Warriors. Apologies for the delays that have been going through in this one. We want to get to the action just as quick as you do, but sometimes other issues arise and put a little bit of delay on things. And you can tell the crowd was, they were kind of waving their hands back and forth <laughs> at this point. They just want to see the action as well. So we understand where you guys are at, but hey, I think no one more so than the players themselves, right? They love playing in front of this crowd and the electricity in this building is just outrageous once those fights pick up. I mean, there's nothing like the Smite World Championships. I mean, the first one I attended was all the way back in season two when Adapting gets that first title for himself. And ever since that moment, I'm like, I've got to be here. If there's a World Championships, whether I'm working or whether I'm just attending it as a fan, you got to be here because there is no energy like the crowd here at the World Championships. I was at that Worlds too, man. I never saw you. You didn't. Did you Did you say hi to me or not? We may have just passed by each other, didn't recognize each other right away. You know how it Why is sometimes. Why would we recognize each other? Did we even know each other? That's then? what I'm saying. We thinking about it. I don't think we knew each other back then. <laughs> well, look at us now, huh? Now we're working together and now we're, thought? now we're kicking butt on the cast. That's what we're doing. We're trying to. I we're, can tell you that much. <laughs> we're certainly trying to. And at this point, I just want to see the Leviathans and the Oni Warriors kick some butt. I really do. It, it's been it's supposed to be a very exciting matchup with these two teams. So they say. The number two, the number three seed coming into this one. Yep. Hard fought battle for both these two teams throughout the regular season of play, throughout the playoffs as well to get them to this point. I mean, when we were talking about the top of the SPL teams, it was a clear cut top three that we all said, these yep. are the top guys. Right. These are the ones you have to look out for in any matchup. And now one of those was eliminated in just the previous game with the six variants. So now it's that battle of second, of third, who is going to come out on top. We are going to take Take it to another quick break. When we come back, we hope to get you back into game one.
my fans apologies for the delay but we are ready to get back into game number one with the leviathans the oni warriors here in the semi-final of the smite world championships we started out with some great action and we're ready to jump into just a little bit more as game number one resumes with the leviathans and the oni warriors already a couple of big kills that have hit on the side of both teams and we can jump ourselves right back into the game this is what i'm talking about j mac finally getting some action underway one to two so far the leviathans were able to answer back after a little bit of a rough start over in solo lane, but Beacon spawns in here at 12. Gold Fury already available, and both of these teams have shown they are not shy of going in for a cheeky pull. And look at this already. Gold Fury being looked at. Look at this. Final judgment not available. Shinto, but no one's even close yet from the Warriors. Warriors don't recognize this yet. Genetics and Etroid, they're heading over to the lane, but I think they just now spotted and maybe not even heard it until this very moment. The Leviathans grab themselves a Gold Fury right out from under the noses of the Oni Warriors. They're going to be able to back up just fine. That was a risky call without finding judgment but I think the play was hey we'll see if you guys are onto us we'll see if you have some ward coverage clearly the only warriors didn't they had to let that one go and that's absolutely free there 
for the Leviathans. But I'm going to continue that conversation we had before. The beads burn, right? That is exactly what the Leviathans are looking for. Adapting and fine. Okay, want to be able to follow up off of each other and chain that CC together. But it can't come forward without the team fight. So far, it's just been, hey, are we in position to go for the objective? No. Beacon goes the way of the Oni Warriors uncontested. Gold Fury goes the way of the Leviathans uncontested. The Pyromancer are spawning here shortly, J Mac. That might be the first time we see a fight. Ultimate out of natural response, but coffin from Wrong Yu tries to pull him back. Beads available and ultimate burned out from Netro. So now both lines of safety removed from the Hunter of the Oni Warriors, the Leviathans. Now with adapting, having that intel, that's a perfect target to go to. And that was almost a pull through the beads. It was very close to being able to net a kill there onto Netroid, but that's gonna be it. Look at this, adapting like a shark. Looks for the beads being down, says, hey, wait a second, I've got fear no evils. Maybe I could stick around here. That blink is finally available as well. So the left lane could be what they're looking for, but Genex is here with Undying Love. Genex available to try and bail out Netroid. Meanwhile, we jump back to the action. Fear No Evil does get the ultimate from Genetics in response. So now, that's ultimate away from the support. Bead still down from the Hunter. Adapting doesn't quite have that level of cooldown to just go back to this lane and do it once more, though. Yeah, the only play they could go for is maybe Final K goes back, upgrades the Teleport, but Pyromancer is going to go down for absolute free. Shinto not in range, and the Oni Warriors wow. pick up that Pyromancer. Again, that's three uncontested objectives. One for the Levi's, two for the Warriors. And they're going to take that every day of the week. Send a Runic Bomb over to Pagon's pocket, and if you get him alone with a, with a tower now, he could just drop that Runic Bomb and get plenty of gold for his team. And we've seen just how aggressive that Pagon loves to play, no matter the god that he's going towards. Even if it is this late game scaling style of team up, we've been seeing him jump in aggressively. Two man, three man jumps out of the mid laner from the Oni Warriors. Just no fear coming from him. But do you see the spawn of, of the purple buff? Genex and Netroid going to group the camps together, but Wrong Yu and Adapting waiting. That coffin is back up for Wrong Yu. There is an ultimate to respond for Netroid if need be, but. The Leviathans just take the buff right away from the Oni Warriors. That's the only action we get, right? The Oni Warriors said, hey, we don't have beads. There's no reason for us to step forward without just undying love. And they just decide to back up. And we've been talking about this totem control. Sot has it locked down. Nine, ten for the Oni Warriors. He's just been owning this lane since that gank, since Final K dropped down one kill. And that's all right, right? The Cerberus is going to be a little bit tankier naturally, right? The Guardians are OK with just being sort of CC bots. It's just the farm aspect that is going to start to hurt. Itemization is going to start to hurt as well. And Whoa. look at that damage. Pagon, he's in trouble. Well, Shinto's not going to take that one lying down. He's going to try and go for a kill, but he's going to use every resource. Adapting bails him out. It's the junglers who pick up a kill each. The mid laners both gone. Pagon nets from getting the tier one tower at the exact same time. So at the end of the day, it's a net positive for the Warriors. And that is ridiculous, because that's a play that didn't need to happen. Panda Cat forced into the mounted archery because of the aggression. And Netroid trying to grab the beads, not going to get him. Panda Cat knows underneath the tower, he's all right. But here comes Adapting and Wrong You. They want to chase down here. Genetics has ultimate. Netroid falling low. The Lovebirds are there. Undying Love now used, but Wrong You is waiting. And Netroid gets the flip, the style kill on Adapting. It's a fourth on the board for the Oni Warriors. Wrong You just too late to the own party. Yep. You Cannot try and fight into the Undying Love. There wasn't enough DPS and adapting. Did not bring enough, but I want to dial it back. The Runic Bomb, Pagon, goes in for that Tier 1 tower. A huge play for his team, but then greets the Aegis. Thinks he can jump over the final judgment, and Shinto smacks him with it and says, absolutely not. I want that solo kill. Doesn't end up getting it, of course. Adapting had to help him out, but still, Shinto playing aggressive on this mid lane. The Warriors now can start pulling ahead a bit in gold. 2,500 nearly for the Chaos side team over the Leviathans. And you remember, the Leviathans are the one who took maybe the most valuable objective this early in the game in that Gold Fury. It's just been all the kills and the follow-up after for the Oni Warriors and maybe a bit of totem dip as well. 11 to 2 on the scoreboard for SOT. And that's what the benefit is, right? You get that MP5, you, don't, you can stick around a little bit longer, you can get some extra farm. And the net worth of this Odin, top of the charts for a reason. I mean, I get plenty, but... Oni Fury is up, and already the Oni Warriors are here, but the Leviathan's not too far behind. Now, Bask and Shinto gets the objective. Doesn't matter. Wrong you, Panda Cat. Show themselves on a ward. And the Oni Warriors will back away from the objective. Though they got it low, down to almost a quarter HP. If they had even just an extra second or two, maybe. They could have burned that one before the Leviathan's got in range, but 
as long as Shinto is on the map and you don't know where he's at, could be a dangerous flank for him. Yeah, that's the difference maker, right? And something I've noticed, Shinto has had this speed buff for a big portion of the game, right? He has not been too interested in grabbing red. He wants to be a bit faster, wants to be able to juke a bit more and just be able to avoid damage. I wonder if he's going to continue to do so until late, late game, but either way, hard to lock down a Thoth already with that evade and punish, can just control so much ground. Throw a speed buff in the mix and it gets even harder. It's just a fast little bird running through the mid lane. Leaves the red buff on the ground. May go by. Pick that one up a little bit later. But now the Warriors have vision on the Fury. You guys see Wrong Yu, Panda Cat, grouping around the objective, wondering if the Oni Warriors go for the pull. They've got four on this side of the map. And SOT is already on the way. It teleports down. And the Oni Warriors will pull the Fury to start this one out. But there are still a few members of Leviathans nearby. A pick is going to be necessary to try and take this one away. Fine, OK. Teleported in. The Cerberus has arrived. And because of that, the Oni Warriors call off the pull once again. I mean, Shinto was spotted out in mid lane. They knew Final Judgment was not going to be a contester. But you still don't have that great a burst on the side of the Oni Warriors. They, they already have the lead. They don't have to go for risky calls like this. I can understand the retreat, but Pyromancer's back up, and that's something that the Oni Warriors would love to grab. Not gonna happen. The Leviathans are the first ones over here. Sot finds four of the Leviathans roaming through the jungle right to the Pyromancer. Pagon on the way. Steal opportunity. Throws the tornado in the wall, but only fine. Fine, okay, but with four of the Leviathans on the right side of the map, the Oni Warriors go for the pull onto the Gold Fury instead. There's three there to take the objectives, and this won't even be an even trade unless the Leviathans can get this one and confirm it for themselves. Pagan around the corner has opportunity to steal it away, but he does not secure there for the Leviathans who will trade out objectives. Yeah, you gotta go in for the trade there. When you know the Oni Fury is going down uncontested, I think using the final judgment just to make sure that a steal doesn't come through is the right call, and that's what they do. Now, Wrong Yu gets to pick up that Runic Bomb. Pay attention to the Tier 1s. That's exactly where they need to be used to try and get some gold back in your pocket and sort of climb back in to this game gold-wise. But still, the Leviathans didn't pick this composition to win the early game. They didn't pick this composition to just dominate every single lane. They picked it for grouping up around Fire Giant fights and trying to, you know, chain those CCs together. That is still yet to be seen, right? We haven't seen any of the FG pulls. The Oni Warriors still don't hate jungle fights either. I think that this Odin is going to be a big threat because we talked about possible beads. No, Sod said, I'm not fearful of that CC. I've got the blink, so pay attention to Shinto, Wrong Yu, and Bandicat. Getting trapped in the cage could be bad. Bandicat tries to take shield buff nearly with the help of the minions, takes down Tier 1 Tower, but comes up empty-handed on both fronts there. Look at the lead that's starting to develop between the dual lane, at least in the support role. 16 is the level for genetics. Meanwhile, Wrong Yu, two levels down to the opposition, even for the front line on the opposite side of the map here, the solo laner, Sot, still holds, holding on to that two-level lead over Final K. It's just been continuing to develop over the course of this game. And that's what I'm talking about. The Odin will be the tankiest guy in the map for quite some time, but eventually there will be a fall-off point, right? The, the Odin cannot just exist and be this absolute menace and 1v1 carries forever. Odin doesn't have the greatest late game. He, they, they, if the Oni Warriors want to make the best use out of Sot being this fed, they need to group up now. They need to look towards Shinto, who takes over to level 20. They need to look towards Panacat, who's very far behind as far as levels go to the other tanks, right? 19 to 17, not going to be the biggest deal, especially when you look at his build. He did this already the other day, but this Odiba in the third slot doesn't mean tanks are going to be shredded. It's just going to be a lot of AoE damage. Now, we've been seeing kind of this battle between the two Hunter builds. You go the crit route, you go the shred route. It's kind of becoming a 50-50 for both of them. Not really one with a clear advantage over the other, but we'll see how it works out for Panacat. We'll see how it works for Netroid. At least for now, Panacat can know that he's got the first Tier 1 tower on his side of the map, taking that one away from Netroid, removing some of that safety. But it's been rather quiet from adapting the last few minutes, Charlie. I'm starting to get a little worried for Leviathans and maybe even for the Oni Warriors because they haven't really run into this Hunbats in quite some time. They haven't. Sacred Monkey Toss goes in, so adapting could try and TP, but doesn't feel like it's necessary. And at this point, again, he doesn't want to be the first one in. That, that's the case. Once Final K rotates in, they have so much better engage, but he's been stuck in lane. The Leviathans haven't felt the need to pressure. This lead is not so astronomical that they have to force something to stem the bleeding. I, I don't think I'm too worried about the Leviathans for that late game team fight. That is still what they're looking towards, but. The Oni Warriors likely be the ones to try and force a little bit more. They, they still have Runic Bomb to deal with from Wrong Yu, so it's not as if they can leave a tower unguarded. But they have that engage, man. The, I, I want to see this Odin get active pretty soon. It's 21 minutes into the game, and Fire Giant hasn't even been a topic of conversation. Sot willing to trust his tankiness and his ability to survive 
over anything else, uh, foregoing the idea of the Purification Beats, does pick up that Blink as a second Relic. So look towards Sot to be the primary initiator now for the Oni Warriors, that much easier way of getting straight to that back line, holding on to some safety for an escape. Pyromancer and Fury both about to respawn, but the Oni Warriors are grouped up around the Fire Giant instead. They're gonna pull the objective, and now with the ring up, the Leviathan should know that this Fire Giant's starting to fall down. It's half HP, but instead the Warriors are gonna commit over towards Final K. Instead, who's in the back line? Final trying to jump away from the team, gets back in the pit. Sot never gave up the leash on the objective, but finally, the only Warriors will walk away from this one. But now it's Final K holding on to it. Might need to walk out of the pit to reset this one. Yeah, even with Final Judgment, a risky call to not drop that Fire Giant there. The Leviathan are just happy they had a soft defense and they can back up. But the only Warriors, maybe the Tier 1 is on their eye now. They want to push in and grab some extra gold in their pocket. It seems to be uncontested, but Sachi was in. He wants to try and catch out Final K. Final K's already jumped away, so he's got nowhere left to go. He uses the ultimate to try and bail himself out. Nearly going down. It's Panatom in the back line to grab him, and he's going to go for a second, but Adapting's able to snake away from the team fight. Leviathan's only losing one, but Shinto looks hungry. I think he wants to go for another kill, but with that tornado closing in, the Leviathans have got to give up their chase. If that evade and punish connects, maybe Shinto finds a kill there, but not gonna happen. The Leviathans are just happy that they only lose one. There were some low health bars. Even so, I love that play from Sot. He said, guys, we can go forward. The tier one tower is not the end of this engagement. Fine, okay. Cannot get out if he finds that cage, and that's exactly what happened. Remember, this wasn't a Pyromancer poll, J-Mac. That was a fire giant call. The Oni Warriors in the regular season were known for plays like this. 19-minute fire giant pulls with smaller leads than this. They don't care. As long as they are together, grouped up, they feel confident, and they're going for it again. Now they've got Runic Bomb, so they've got some chance to try and contest on the secure. Adapting has spotted this one out. Fear No Evil is not there. Shinto will be the only one with an ultimate available by that time, but he's been spotted out by Sot, zoned away, and so is Wrong Yu. The cage is down, and the Baron has nowhere to go. It's Pagon who gets the double kill in the fight. Shinto trades out to get one, but Pagon has not given up chase just yet. The Warriors take a two-for-one trade. Adapting's nearby, wants to try and follow Sot over the wall, but he holds that jump, and that's a smart play. Genetics links just to make sure Sot's gonna get out of trouble. Shinto definitely saved that fight, man. That ultimate was massive. If the, the final judgment doesn't connect, you're in a two for zero, and the Oni Warriors are looking for Fire Giant. But without Netroid, you've lost your DPS. They can't go in for the Fire Giant pull, so it's gonna be a reset. 24 minutes in, I would not be shocked if we stalled out towards EFG at this point, because the Shinto, this damage is peppering. It, it is a threat to walk forward. But the Oni Warriors, they have no fear. They are going to continue to walk up and pull the objective as many times as it takes. Even if it's just a bait for a fight, eventually a 5v4 is all they'll need. Final beacon of the first rotation capped off by the Oni Warriors. And they will send the Titans down the right side of the map in that solo lane. Right over next to the Fire Giant where the Oni Warriors have really loved playing these last couple of team fights. Start up fire, bait a couple of Leviathans forward, try and go for a kill. Lather, rinse, repeat. Seems to be the call for the Warriors. This time, though, the Leviathans on the scene first towards fire, recognizing the Warriors might have tried to go for a third potential pull. This time, Leviathan's not going to get caught with their pants down. I mean, Netroid's on the other side of the map, so it was not going to happen at this point, right? You have plenty of damage if you're the Levi's. Like, they could have stepped forward, but Panda Cat not going towards that crit build. Odibo into the kids. It would be a slow burn if they even attempted to go for a pull like that. I think the Leviathans are doing exactly what they should be. Playing safe, sort of always sitting around this FG, never letting it unguarded, but also not stepping up too far. Because Wrong Yu got caught out last time. That cage, once that Phantom Shell is down, is going to be a big target for specifically Wrong Yu. I mean, Shinto is not getting anywhere near. He is staying as far back as possible. So Sot has one main target at the moment. And of course, the back line, you would love to connect with them, but you can also connect with the Baron. Titans have been unleashed and on their way, passing tier one tower line. It's everybody but Pagon on the Oni Warriors over here. Meanwhile, Leviath is missing out on their Hunter. Panacat's gonna go back to base. So this Titan should go down relatively freely for the Oni Warriors. It means they'll be able to try and push up with their own Titan into Leviathan's or They could just let this one leave, head over towards an objective and start one of those up. Seems that is the call for the Warriors. Or maybe they're just going for a flank. Sot charging up that spear for a target, but Throws it right to the wall, doesn't get anybody. Man, those corners, they'll get they'll get you. You can't find the stun. Uh, That's what I was talking about, though. Panatom can always sit a corner and just yoink someone back, find the pole. The Ring of Spears is up. You can see the Fire Giant started, but if you check out that damage, you can tell the only Warriors are baiting here. They're not committing just yet. 
Shinto is raring and ready to fire off that ultimate. You keep seeing him charge it up, cancel it, charge it, cancel. Just he's waiting for that one person to step out of line, that one non-tank to step forward and get clipped by that ultimate. The Fire Giant's been pulled once more by the Warriors. This time, it's at half HP. Wrong Yu steps up, but he's not going to be able to go too far. Immediately into the Covenant Sun. Now, Final Judgment does clip Netro, but Wrong Yu is the first casualty. Killing spree for Pagon, and he's going to keep going forward. His timeline is brought. He gets the second chance of life, but the results are all the same. Final K pulls back one. Genetics goes down. It's Panic Out with the kill. You cannot start the fight with a Final Judgment just chunking the carry, man. Netro was forced to leave. He's back in base right now. Now because of that ultimate. Had the relics available, used them both immediately, and now it's the Leviathans going for the aggressive call. Panatom, Netroid on the way, but final case on zone duty. There's still a Runic Bomb in pocket for the Leviathan. Same for Sot on the side of the Oni Warriors, but their health bars are great. Take a look at Shinto as an example. Sot's pulling him out, but final case got to use his beads to get away from Panatom. That pull on the Susano, pulling him back to the full HP Hunter. Not ideal for the front line of the Leviathans. Oni Warriors grabbing the pyro man so they let the runic bomb go down but sot's got no space for it. he's got a runic bomb and the ward drops the ward so now he's got two bombs the odin as far as i'm concerned that's your fire giant confirm right if you have two runic bombs that's gonna do more damage than pagon ever could so i don't like that idea of the Leviathans trying to contest with a final judgment is going to have a rough time. But Shinto hasn't used it for confirmation. He hasn't been using it for a steel tool. He used it just a half health or 90% someone's HP. Last time, Netroid, at this point, Pagon and Net need to be hovering A's at all times. Speaking of, not available for 90 seconds. Both of these carries. Yep. So at this point, now you got to hope that one of you is linked to genetics. And you better hope that the ultimate's going his way and that now genetics is fast on the trigger with that ultimate. With these 80 seconds, 70 or so down for the Warriors carries, might not want to try and go for another Fire Giant pull. Probably unideal to really start up one of these fights. So it's the Leviathans now in the driver's seat around the objective, but still about 6,000 gold down to the Warriors. That's not enough though to slow down the Leviathans. This late into the game, 6K is only about 1,000 or so between each of the players. Yeah, it's not gonna be the biggest deal. The Leviathans can definitely still fight, but it's all about the end gauge, right? The Oni Warriors, I've been looking at Sot. He goes in for the stuns, he goes in for the cages. Wrong you was the target, and it looked clean if Shinto wasn't dealt with. I don't think you can put all of your ultimates into the Baron if Shinto is being free casted on, right? You need Panatom to get to the back line. If Sot's going on Wrong you, Panatom needs to find the back line. And he's connected to genetics more often than not. So, hey, either genetics and, and Panatom go in for a wraparound play, or Sot needs to find this back line. Fire Giant's so confused right now. Is anybody going to stay in the pit? Is anybody going to fight to the death inside of this pit alongside me? Haven't seen it just yet. A couple kills, a couple trade outs around the objective from both of these two teams. It's the only Warriors with a small health advantage. In fact, a man advantage for themselves, adapting over on the left side. No chance the only Warriors know that he's over there. So for now, they're just wondering, trying to keep a head count. Who can we see? Who's popped up in a lane recently? So far, nobody's popped up out of sight, at least for the side of the Warriors. Well, J-Mac, it's been about eight or nine minutes since I said we could be looking at EFG territory. And it turns out that is correct. Fire Giant will tick over to Enhanced. And we're still doing the dance around this objective. The only Warriors got bored. They said, we're not dancing anymore. We are pushing forward. Maybe looking at a tier two or just seeing what we can find. The Leviathans though, they're not gonna let this tier two go down for free. They step forward. Sans stun picked up an Ascension Torment and thrown into a fear. There it is. Evil Shinto with the final damage to take him down. He got and now Pagon in danger. Has to use everything to try and get out. Panatom gonna chase that down. He's got one under the tier two tower. Panacat nearly takes him. Final K jumps Hello? over him, but Panacat has got the auto to sweep him in a dive by Shinto locks genetics in place final K doing his best to get the Oni Warriors trapped at the blue buff Pagon dives in but that might be the last thing that he gets to do Aegis ultimate it's just enough to trade out Shinto gets one before Pagon falls down now it's three versus two with the blue buff the stun doesn't connect Netroid just pumping auto attacks out and Shinto uses the evade and punish he has to Aegis because of the damage coming his way but there's low health bars on the side of the Levi's they don't want to step forward. They do not want to keep up this engagement. But look at the teleport in. Final case, full HP. He slowed him down, jumped on top, and now Wrong Yu and Shinto can walk back forward. Final case should be getting his cooldown shortly, but Ultimate is down for just a little while longer. Shinto's coming back off a cooldown soon. If Final K can get them low enough, Shinto can go for a big shot on the ultimate, but
but it's still not oh, all down yet. And now it's SOT. He's back from the grave, and he wants blood. He wants Shinto to go down. He's going to try and take the 1v2 inside of the cage. Time Shinto line. gets the timeline. Brock jump is just on time, and he's able to dash away. Shinto lives through all of it. Final K with the great body blocks to keep him alive. He's not done, though. Sends out the final judge, but oh. genetics just out of range will charge up that back but sot getting the timeline down is not nothing right i mean how many times have we seen shinto get that low not much three and one this game so now if you can connect if you can get to the back line that alternate timeline has been brock Oni warriors going for the pyromancer what a back and forth brawl by the way that was a stun off a of fine okay into the biggest cc chain you can see in the pro scene, and now EFG is looked at once again. The Oni Warriors have three runic bombs in their pocket, and they're gonna start the dance up all over again. Is that enough confidence for the Warriors to 50-50 this objective, though? Fire Giant down to half. Is this a bait or is this a commit? It seems that it was just a bait to get the Leviathans to step forward. The Leviathans are fine. They can sit back knowing they've got a ton of range and a ton of damage just from their mid laner alone. But with Timeline down, for five more minutes on Shinto. Pagon's coming up in 20 seconds. There's an advantage for the only Warriors on a second wind. And remember, Sod can get blown up very easily. Final K has that paralyzing spit. All it would take is stun into Stygian Torment and Adapting will be there waiting. And now it's the Leviathans that go in for their pull. And Shinto's frontlining is doing so much damage. Trying to get any damage he can. Panatom is on the way. It's five versus four in the pit. The objective down to half again. And Shinto Look at cancels Panatom. that final judgment once more. Oh. The objective reset again, but this time it's at the hands of the Leviathans who remove it. SOT walks up, has to jump away. Too many Leviathans standing by. I thought Panatom was going to take that path through the jungle and get to the back line, but he thought better of it. Fine, okay, being a mobile ward for his team. Let Shinto know you're not safe here, buddy. Time to retreat. Fine, okay, isn't going to be able to survive too long in a 1v5, so he's going to keep his distance from the Oni Warriors, but why not grab the beacon? You've got some time to yourself. No one is on EFG, so the only warrior is going to pick that one up and slow down the pace of this game just a little bit. Take a dance from one side of the map to the other to grab this beacon for the Oni Warriors, and now splitting themselves up a little bit. Both the junglers not over on this right side of the map just yet. Both of them trying to get some of these camps, get that extra farm to try and finish out some of their builds, get some of these potions online, because we're starting to approach six slot territory for a lot of these players. Both mid laners fully statted out, adapting just now gets to go back and finish up his last item in the Blood Forge. The only people who aren't sitting at a full build right now essentially are just the supports. Yeah, and they've got the Bountiful Bow online as well, so you still have your recipe. You're getting a bit more value there if you are wrong, you. We are in the same situation we've been in since about 22 minutes, J-Mac. Back and forth, one misplay, one overextension, one bit of hard CC could split this game wide open. So much on the line. World's Finals, that's the target. That's what both of these teams are fighting for, but you gotta get through game one, the momentum, this crowd, everything is gonna be in your favor if you can just take game number one. And so far, the Oni Warriors have been stepping forward. Now, fine, okay, take some auto attacks from Nat, forced to retreat, but look at this Leviathans, look like they're going for a little bit of an ambush here. They're setting up for anything that they can. Sot gonna get rooted in place, lose about 30% of his health. There it is. Same final judgment. Who takes on Shinto goes in and Pagon jumps out. The Oni Warriors take a bit too much damage to their mid laner, and that's gonna take a long time to heal back up. The Leviathans might not give him a chance, to just go back so freely. They're still pushing forward and spotted out. Panatom rooted out, beads gone, coffin up, and the ultimate used by Genetics. It's gonna be Netro nearly pulled back in the coffin, but final case health bar falling low. He's gotta go back to base. Yeah, that one looked like a pop possible fire giant call there for the Leviathans, but they thought better of it. Panatom got caught out trying to go for a wraparound, and now the teleport from Sot was coming through. Got canceled once, not gonna get canceled again. The Oni Warriors wanna chase this down. They know Final K needs to go back to base, and he has no teleport for 20 seconds. This could be the opening the Warriors won. Fire Giant started up by the Warriors. It's going to be a 4v5, and it might not even get that. Sot uses the cage. Rudy the bombs. Fire Giant's low. Every Rudy Bob drops. The the they it. steal it away through three. Rudy Bob's it's not enough damage to take it away from the team. The Leviathans clutch out with the objective. A basic attack from Panda Cat. 264 damage. That is ridiculous. Wasn't even the hieroglyphic assault from Shinto. That wasn't even max range. And now the Atlantis Leviathans, after overextending a bit, bait. The Oni Warriors, you said it best, J-Mac, three runic bombs, that is ridiculous odds 
and Leviathans come out ahead. Now they get a Rick Bomb for themselves, and they get to push with an enhanced Fire Giant 36 minutes into this game. Three Runic Bombs, and it wasn't even a crit auto that took it. It's just a plain old basic Jane auto attack that Panda Cat throws out there to weave in and steal it away. The Oni Warriors now with no buff around their waist. It's all five for the Leviathans, and now the team that has been behind this entire game can try and put themselves in the driver's seat. Primal Fury down, Leviathans head to the left side of the map. They're gonna group up. The Oni Warriors, not a team to get kicked over lightly, though. I wouldn't be surprised if they set up an ambush in the jungle, tried to find a relic, trying to find something. But as for now, they know the Levi's are going back to base. They know they've got some time to figure out how they want to go in for the siege. And if you thought Shinto was doing a lot of damage before, Take a look at those consumables. Picks up the Elixir of Power. His timeline up in 23 seconds. This thought is going to be a problem. And I haven't seen many answers for it yet. Of course, there's been plenty of damage, but when you get red buff, when you get a 3k pot and enhanced fire giant, those ults that we're doing 1300 are going to be one shot. The amount of times I've seen Shinto dash at the enemy team as he's a, a he's Thoth a, by himself he's insane. is criminal. He's been punished one time for it out of what? Uh, almost this, every two hands I can count that he's done that. Pagan of Genetics might try and go for a flank though at the tier two tower. This is risky. They're wrapping around the back, charging up the ultimate is Shinto. He'll let it fly, but it's an ultimate for Genetics to immune it out. And now Fine OK, wrong you, trying to bail away. They got the tier two tower. Now Leviathan's got to play careful. Final judgment down, so Shinto wants to back up. The one shot potential has left us. But this is what I'm talking about. The, the Oni Warriors could have just sat under Bird, right? They could have sat underneath the Phoenix and just played it safe. That's not their style. They hide inside of a red buff just to see if the Tiamat Aphrodite gank could have brought something new to the table. In this case, though, it can be risky trying to defend against an EFG. A couple Hunter Auto attacks at this stage of the game could get rid of that Phoenix no problem. Constant poke by Shinto. How do you outrange a Thoth when it comes to damage, when it comes to a poke war? He's going to want to hit one of these carries eventually with it if they want to have a chance to really fight under this Phoenix. The Leviathan's playing cautiously. Fine, okay, he's got his teleport. He's gonna head back to base and jump back in on the ward right next to the team. And now Leviathans can reset themselves. Panda Cat able to walk in, deal most of the damage to the Phoenix. But look at Netro's health getting poked out. Panatom trying to take the 1v1 against Adapting, and that's a losing battle for Panatom. Now no beads available to the jungler. Here's the old Shinto's been waiting for the final judgment, sends it towards Netro, who goes for the Aegis, but now Rong using a little bit of Rong trouble. Rongyu locked in the cage, final K with three of the ultimate. The coffin's not enough to save Rongyu, but it can help out the rest of the team. Genex is Sonar low, but Panatom has found his way to the back, and he's gonna get to make it no, almost three. Shinto timeline down, the whole Leviathan crumble at the Phoenix. The Warriors defend their burn. And now they've got plenty of time, J-Mac. Look at those respawn timers. They're going to run it down mid. They don't have a minion wave. They're going to walk right over that beacon. How much can they get without the minions? Look at those respawn timers. They have so much time. 40 seconds. The Leviathans are back up. A tier two tower standing in both lanes, and a tier one is going to make this Titan very tanky. They're going to need the help of a minion wave to get there, but they don't have one. They're just going to brute force their way oh, they through got the it. bird to the Titan. 25 seconds. The Leviathans they got it. banked it all on killing the Phoenix, but the Oni Warriors defend. They hold strong, and they turn it back around. You see a fire giant we take your life and take game number one what a ridiculous play that all starts from panatom losing the 1v1 right he steps up to adapt and goes nope don't like that have to retreat but then panatom gets the re-engage he finds his way to the back line finally shinto does not get to free cast the fight away and the leviathans come crumbling down in one swift team fight one swift defense from the oni warriors and all the cc in the world not enough to save the Leviathan's team. They used that Fear No Evil in the 1v1 versus Panatom, and now they're lacking that AOA CC, that fear. The Aegis is already pulled away from Netroid. If you yep. can get the beads from him as well, from adapting, could have been such a big turnaround fight for Leviathans, but they use so many resources in the pre-battle, they don't have anything for the actual fight. And that's the thing, they were not so far behind that they couldn't step forward. Remember, they looked for invades in the jungle, they looked for a wraparound play, they stopped at the Phoenix and said, we're not giving this up just because you stole EFG. We still feel confident in this engage, and that's exactly what happened. They stood their ground and said, if you don't one-shot us with Final Judgment, which Netroid Aegis, we can win this fight. Well, with that, the Oni Warriors able to take game number one here in our second semi-final. They need two more to make it to the Grand Finals. Can they do so? We'll find out in game number two.
genetics is POV, I believe. Yeah, build it back up. <laughs> I love the taunt. Oh no, and then he claps at him. <laughs> what? This isn't, tr that's not real. That is not real. I like genetics a lot because he's just like, what you see is what you get, you know what I mean? He's, he's not really putting on a show when he's like being mean or, or, or talking smack on Twitter, right? And I respect people like that. I think any support player would tell you he's a very, very talented player, obviously a very confident player. You can tell that just from listening to him speak for 10 seconds about the way he sees the game or how sure of his opinions he is. A shot caller like him is always gonna win you games because you want people to be proactive on the map. And I feel like he gets people to be proactive. He doesn't want lazy people. He doesn't want lazy players that just farm, that just do this like a book. Genetics, comms, and uh, shot calls can be a, a double-edged sword. You can see the best and worst of it, I think, in this full split. There were even games that were closer than they needed to be because sometimes you don't have to reinvent the wheel. Sometimes you're 3K ahead and you can just play 3K ahead. He has a style that he likes to play and he, I feel like when he's on a team, they're gonna play the way he wants to play for sure. I think we've seen that with the Warriors. And I think it's worked well for the Warriors too. Like maybe they haven't had the same win loss as last phase or whatever, but they've still really good team, top of their division. He's probably one of the best players on the team, but he has these two or three picks that if you ban out, you have a much better chance. And it's not because the drop off is necessarily that bad, but since he's like the focal point of the team, like if he's not controlling the game on like a Kepri or something and walking around objectives, it just feels like he's not nearly as useful. He is kind of predictable in the way he plays, you know. If the Warriors are behind and Gold Fury is coming up, he's not going to be there. He's going to be trying to do fire. You know, he's very predictable, but Ill predictable in that sense and in terms of his gods as well. Like he does have two or three gods that he plays to like the best like possible standard, like the gold standard of support. And then after that, it's not the same as like the other three gods that he's best at. We don't care about the regular season like that we have. Uh... This, this 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 phase because I feel like we weren't we weren't aiming for that right we were, we were just aiming for improving as a team uh, getting the personalities and everything the way we want to play being on the same page pretty much they just got to be careful uh, it's not always the most calculated um, decisions from genetics it just depends what shows up on game day yeah I think people are pretty pretty accurate with their assessment. Um, Obviously, they're absolutely terrified of my main two characters year in, year out. It's why I'm the most banned player in the league. But uh, yeah, I guess it's uh, it's not, not too far off there. Yeah. It was, yeah. Like, it was like a, like a good amount. 50%? Yeah, 50%. 20 right? 20? Yeah, I mean, there's like, you know, a little bit of glaze, but like. Uh... There's like, there was like a, lack of, a lack of Yomoja gate plays, I kind of thought. Like, I was kind of someone saying, like, that guy's the goat Yomoja, it's not even close, but no one said that. So. Yeah, I want to go back on that one and say the. Only games Kings won this year were the games where I did exceptional shot calling in the first half of the year. Um, you can watch back. There was like a game where we packed all that tie-in when we were losing to Dragons. I don't know. Uh, also worked well last year at Worlds, so I guess copium for that one, but it's fine. It's a fine opinion, I suppose. I'm
into the deep abyss I'll go stay off my radar Cause I never miss you yeah. doing a lot of smiting here this weekend and wouldn't be possible without our back-end tech partners rally here who are powering the back-end of smite. We've been playing a lot of smite. You at home been playing a lot of smite. We will play a lot of smite in the future. So it's an awesome partnership to have and thanks to rally here for helping us out along the way. Game one in the books, I think, right? We're, we, we're through game one of this best of five. We've got- Nailed it. I still got it, Miff. I still got it. Steel Series Moments of Glory will walk us through what happened here in game one. It's the Oni Warriors taking things over the Atlantis Leviathans. Hazer, what do you see here in game one? There was a lot of back and forth smite there. I feel like the Oni Warriors played just slightly better than Leviathans, got a little bit unlucky on that FG earlier on, getting it stolen away. I think it was by a 256 damage all from Panda Cat, something like that. No crit again from the Hatchie Man. SOT on this Odin looked absolutely immense the whole game. 
And look at him crush that totem. And, you know, I'm giving props to the crowd. They've kept up their totem energy. We've been here a long time today, and we're still cheering for it. Miff, what'd you like from the Oni Warriors in game one? You know, I was actually really impressed by their control around the objectives. It's something Hazer was bringing up uh, around the original desk. I know, awkward to say after a fire giant steal, but I thought the Odin cages from SOT just to create that space were really well placed. I felt like target selection was very, very high, but when it's the Oni Warriors, so often it comes down to just small mechanical outplays, which is hard to say, you know, it's not like genius stuff, it's more so these guys hit their buttons incredibly well. Yeah, and it was these guys playing together as this five-man team, and we talked about it on the desk where this is not an easy comp to play, there's gonna be a lot of having to be on the same page, there's not a ton of CC, not a ton of stuff to go off of, but Solar Patrol and Panatom were diving together incredibly well, Pagon was opening up massive opportunities for them by also jumping in, so together they were just diving really well together, and then this Aphrodite and the, the Aegis by Netroid, the Aegis by Pagon, they were all ready for this Thoth. I could not imagine the Shinto not doing as much damage or not executing off the map. He still got one or two. But there was huge Aegises, huge Aphrodites that were stopping that damage. Yeah, I feel like the Thoth struggled a little bit with the, the dive as well. I feel like I've, I've never seen a, a Tiamat jump in as many times as I saw Pagon jump in that game and get away with it. Dropping 32k damage, highest damage on his team, just a little lower than Shinto, but the poke from the Thoth probably making up that difference. Pagon was getting in there deep, and sometimes with the Afro link, we even saw them go for a flank at one point. Afro and Tiamat linked. I didn't love that play, but it showed the confidence. Could you believe how tanky the Tiamat looked when linked up with that Aphrodite as well? The quadrupedal stance passive alongside Aphrodite's passive. Felt like it was, Pagon was just unkillable in so many of those engagements. It, it was almost a bait. Like, you, you want to jump on my mid laner, right? His escape's down. Probably not, right? Leave him alone next time. I'm curious what we will see from the Leviathans to change things up in picks and bands for game number two. In we go to find out the answer to that question. Bobby, tell me what you want to see from the Leviathans. <laughs> give me a break, Miff. I'm, I'm, I'm still knocking off the rust halfway through game two. Bobby, what are you looking for from the Leviathans? Yeah, yeah Miff, leave him alone. That's good Miff, enough. Me, all right, all right. Don't anything, guys. I am, Miff, I am your best friend. <laughs> Oh, man. <laughs> Miff like looking out of the crowd there, for support. There's none no, out there, Miff. You got no help out there, <laughs> Talk Miff. Talk about P's and B's. And going into P's and B's. Picks and bands starting kind of the same way. Athena gone, a Willix gone, a couple of those supports gone. And, and Genetics talks about this before even getting into game. He tweeted it out. He said he was going to retweet his tweet after Kepri and Yamoja got banned. And instantly, this game and last game and... To add to that, Aphrodite now also banned three bans towards genetics. I mean, Mama, he, he pilots these characters very well. And the first pick, Maman, after showing no prio, absolutely no prio to her last game, seems like the Levi's are just trying to switch that everything up. And we know that the Levi's are capable of playing this Milan Brigitte in multiple roles. For sure. I do prefer to see it in jungle. I feel like it does very much so fit adapting style, but that flexibility can have some ripple effects on the rest of P's and B's. Personally, I might even prefer to see the Leviathans kind of hide that pick by maybe looking towards dual lane in the top three. I'm interested to see what the Warriors go for here. Do they run that Odin back? We have seen it be very, very powerful so far, but no, it's a switch up. Genetics gets three bans against him and decides to go for another pick, Ganesh. Not a character that we've seen Genetics play all that much over the year. Maybe one that he's picked up similar to PBM over practice in the last few months. There's been a lot of practice time for these teams to figure out some new picks going into this tournament. And something that's interesting about Genetics and how he likes to play the meta he will play his top three, four characters and he'll try to lock them in as much as he can. After that, he doesn't put as much time towards those next gods. He likes perfecting those gods that he mains. And I think Ganesh is kind of like that next pick that he's going to. So he's trying to lock that in early. And on top of that, there's not a lot of good picks left into this Ganesh. I mean, the Aphrodite is a good pick, gone. I, I think Yemoja has a, a solid matchup into it, also gone. So now what is the Levi's gonna answer this with? I wonder if they could go back towards the Kron. We could maybe see that death ball style they've looked to play previously. They did the only win with Yeah, I love that guy. I love that guy. Hazer, has it really turned around that much since World Star? Hey, we finally get it on her. 
on her band out 80% of the time here this weekend. We've seen one on her game, one win from the on her, and Panda Cat gets a storied pick. And that's exactly it. You're if this isn't Yeah, yeah, <laughs> good read. If this is not Panda Cat, we're not seeing the on her locked in. It's been banned, but it's because these top four teams, there's a player on one of the sides that really does like this pick. Coast last game, now Panda Cat here. And now I just want to see them dive even more into that nice. duo lane. Yes, Mifflin does totem. not hit Totem. <laughs> I'm a caster, guys. What are you? Of course not. But when you're in game, are you prioritizing Totem? I'm a jungler. He only ganks. He doesn't even get Totem after the gank. He leaves to go farm more. Well, that's anyway, the soul laner's job. <laughs> Beyond her, I really do like it. I just want them to draft more pressure into this duo lane and keep playing through that lane. Interesting. The peg on went towards the Merlin this time. The Tiamat that he did so much work on last game was available. Switching up, going towards the Merlin, and on the other side, Thor locked in, which I think. I don't know. Fine, okay. I don't think he's much Whoa. of a Thor solo guy. So does that mean that the man will be heading to the mid lane? It's hard to say. I, I think, again, flexibility at play here. We've seen a lot of Thor solo from a few teams so far this weekend, and it does have its place in the meta. But if there's going to be a Thor player on the side of the Leviathans, I don't think anyone's got as much history on this pick as adapting himself. King Kennet earned the title on that Thor. I'd like to see it in the jungle, but I'd also like to see Maman in the jungle. It's an awkward spot. I think knowing that it's Merlin on the other side, Maman actually has a much better matchup into that than something like a Thoth that can just outrange you all the time. And I think I agree. I, I want this Maman going mid. I I'm, I'm a little 50-50 on which one I like seeing her more in, but in a game like this, put the Thor in jungle, give it to King Kennet, give him that Thor, and then in solo lane, I, I want to see adapting leave that serve in game one. I thought it was a fine pick, possibility of burning uh, beads, the, the opportunity for the team to punish those beads being down, but I didn't like how it left the solo lane to be. And in those team fights, he wasn't able to get a lot done. I want to see him on something active, something like solo troll and that Odin, willing to teleport in, willing to make that rotation, make fights happen. Nike is gone, and that's one that I wanted to maybe see potentially, but we still have the Osiris, we still have the Bologna, Will they be proud here? Will they kind of play for that counter pick here? Bologna locked in. Remembered. That's one of them. Bologna been on the rise here this weekend. What will Fine OK play out of Solo if it's not going to be the Thor? Fine OK has made a heck of a career out of playing aggressively and opening up a lot of space for his teams. Set, knocks both band away. Bologna locked in here, Miff. Kuzumbo huh. hover. That's interesting. And the Kukulin cover. That is a storied player god combo, if I've ever seen wow. one for the Leviathan solo. I mean, it's a it's a relatively low range composition here for the right. of Leviathans. But it's a lot of dive potential. It would be miserable to exist as Merlin between Kuzumbo and Kukulin alone. I mean, good luck to Merlin, and that's not taking into account Maman and Thor on top of it. But when I see a composition that has four dedicated divers, it makes me concerned for the back line. Can on her subsist on his own? Can he survive out there? I'm not so sure. He's going to be diving with everyone, right? Everyone jumps in all at once. Maybe. That's Jump how, party. Dunk party. That's how I play the game, and that's why I'm bad. Hazer, looking at all five of the Leviathans now. Answer Miff's question, maybe. Are you worried about this on her in the back line? That's exactly the point I was going to bring up, Miff. I'm very, very concerned about this on her. How is the on her? <laughs> gonna live against this Bologna dive. We just saw what Nika did on the Bologna, <laughs> running down characters who are much, much safer than this Anher. And now the second time we've seen it this weekend, Panatom goes back to the Gilga jungle. And, and my other worry with this, Anher gonna be backlining by himself, getting dove by this Gilga Bologna. You're diving into a Ganesh. You're diving into the Merlin. The Merlin wants you to fight on top of him. The Ganesh wants you to fight on top of him. And that's exactly what they're trying to do. And this is just going to be a really risky time by the Levi's because they have to play these fights really clean, really well. They're going to have to have good engages, good beads pulling potential. And it's going to be a lot on this Maman, this Thor to clean stuff up because they don't really have a ton of damage on this dive. <laughs> Sorry, Miff and I, Genetics had some very poignant points there. You, you were listing. He looked like he went tweaking, one, two, he three, was tweaking for one, sure. two. Exactly uh, what the Oni Warriors need, some direction here. Well, maybe not. They won game number one. Maybe that's what the Leviathans need. Hazer, what do you want to see from this Leviathans composition to even the score in uh, game two? I want to see them go back to that playstyle we saw in their first set in the quarterfinal where they are aggressive. I want to see them running the map. I want to see the Oni Warriors cowering under towers. I want to see a 5-6k gold lead by 15 minutes. That's what I want to see from the Leviathans. I want them to 
play the aggressive style. They tried to run it back to a bit more of a wait it out, go to fire style last time out. I want them to control this game and to make the Oni Warriors scared of their early game. And I agree wholeheartedly. I think that they need to win this game and dominate that early portion. And I want them to do it through duo. Let Final K kind of exist in solo lane by himself. Try to get the totems. It's not going to really happen into the Bologna. But play through duo. Get these shield camps. Even play for purples. We've really not seen too many purple invades. But what does Onher do better than most other hunters? He really does invade those purple buffs well. And he can kind of snowball the lane very easily. And even leaning into that, I'm looking at the Oni Warriors draft, and it doesn't exactly scream to me hyper late game, but when I look at the Leviathans, I think, how does this look in the late game? I, I don't exactly see a clear win condition just by ease of securing kill. I, I think that's where it really is. If Mamont and Brigitte isn't alive, it's actually a relatively low damage output composition. So for the Oni Warriors at the absolute latest portions of the match, it's deal with Maman, ignore everyone else. Kuzumbo is going to chase you down. He'll try and disrupt. He's not killing you on his own. Kakulin's got that big initiation, not killing you on his own. On her can do it somewhat, but not exactly a late game hyper carry hunter there either. Well, fellas, we're either going to a game four or it's going to take another reverse sweep. We'll find out which after game number two. We'll go down to your casters to start it off. Thank you so much. Over on the desk, game number two with the Leviathans and the Oni Warriors ready to kick off here in just a moment. The Oni Warriors commanding almost the entirety of game number one. The Leviathans able to sneak a fire giant away from them, steal it right from out under them with a single basic attack from Panda Cat. But then we get to that seed to the late game, and that is where the Oni Warriors fight best when their back's against the wall, when they've got to go on those defenses. And now they get to run it back here in game number two, Trelly. They certainly do. Not only that, adapting on the Thor on the world stage. That's got to be a sight for sore eyes. Uh, these Anvil of Dawns are going to be connecting pretty quick on in the game and just absolutely deleting people because this is one of his namesakes, man. This is how most people were introduced to adapting this exact pick. I'm excited to see it in action. But the Oni Warriors, they want to stop that in its tracks. Panatom on the Gilgamesh. Goes blink, not fearful of the CC, but something I brought up on the desk last set. When you see Maman in mid, and Shinto in particular, he's going to start that blink. He wants to get aggressive. He wants to close gap onto Pagan. So pay attention to those mages. I wouldn't be surprised if we saw a fight at even level two. Yeah, that level two is so crucial in those mid 2v2 matchups. So. We'll keep eyes on Shinto and adapting. Again, going back to adapting on the Thor. Yeah, I mean, if you've been watching Smite for as long as I have, and that's been a very long time at this point, this is the god for adapting. This is the one that he won that first world championship that he got at in season two, comes back in season three, does it all over again, and then he jumps back in the league, and we all go, I wonder if he still got it. Gets one game of Thor, no one let him touch this god again. Yep, it was constantly banned away from adapting, and now get to see it in action. Those walls are going to be very potent as well. It's not as if the Oni Warriors love to beat like just the Thor wall when there's so much more CC you have to worry about from Wrong You, from Fine OK, from Panda Cat as well. So keep your eyes peeled. Beats still big topic of conversation there. But speaking of the Kuzenbo, I mean, that's going to be a, a blink start from Wrong You. He wants to get aggressive. That is the play style you see when a Kuzenbo gets locked in. Fine OK did take a ton of damage there, but Lord doesn't have too much kill potential if that bludgeon's not hitting early on. Yeah, that actual slam of the bludgeon misses, so Final K can resustain on potions and try and poke back against SOT. They could call in a pick that we're no stranger to as far as the solo lane meta is concerned. Well, they haven't seen in a long time, but I think Dave puts it best over on the desk. This is the player god combination that we've grown so accustomed to for Final K. Yep, I've been loving the Kukulin. It's not the worst pickup in the meta currently. It hasn't been, you know, slept on, I would say, but it takes a bit to get online, right? If you're, especially if you're going bluestone like Fine OK is, it's not going to be that Warrior's Axe Warrior. You're going to be looking to, you know, upgrade it later on and then scale those abilities together, which, of course, Kukulin has a ton of them. About that time of the game where both junglers split up, adapting nearby, but even with a wall, unless Fine OK transforms like he just does, no kill potential. Wall double tap thrown. Sot not able to steal the buff away. Shinto playing in the tower line of Pagon, but I'm glad you brought up Warriors X because that's not the starter I expected to see on Solar or Troll. We've yeah. been seeing consistently Death's Toll when you play Bologna, Osiris, even the Gilgamesh of Prior. What makes it seem worthwhile to go for that Warriors Axe start for the Bologna? Axe of Animosity, man. That, that, that's got to be the play call, right? You're playing for late game. You want those auto attacks to chunk. You build into the HP, that's exactly what's going to happen. So Sot is certainly playing 
for the late game, whereas Fine OK wants to just own in lane right now, which is exactly what we'll be seeing. So adapting has a pretty good target at level five. Heads over to right lane. He could look for SOT. If that Eagles rally gets forced, could be some good stuff. But just like last game, the totem is a topic of conversation. And this time, Fine OK getting the better end of it. Well, he went down, I think it was 2 to 11 last game, so it can really only go up from there for Fine OK. 1 1 split on the totems, but very quiet in action for both these teams. We've seen the junglers rotate over towards lanes, adapting, trying to poke a little bit at Sot, not really getting too much. Saw them both rotate over, junglers at least, to the mid lane to try and get some extra help. And specifically for Pagon on this Merlin, this is not a great early game god up against something as aggressive as the Mamon. If that flicker ever goes down, I'm expecting an all-in from Shinto. Yeah, and you can look at that build as well. Shinto not going for the traditional Book of Thought. Looks like to be starting a Bancroft's Talon. Wants some extra light steal in the kit, trying to go for 1v1. And that's going to come online a bit earlier, right? You don't have to stack up Bancrofts. So you're going to come out of the gate with a ton of damage. So, as you said, Pagon might be the target of some of that aggression, especially from Shinto. I wonder where they decide to get active, though. Like I said, early game, right side of the map is the target. But with Angel of Dawn, with adapting, he can really take his pick. It's not as if Panatom is unkillable either with the Blink Star. But actually, hold on, there is a Thor nearby. He's not going to go in for anything, though. Sot recognizes it and just backs up. Wise not to try and stand your ground when adapting is nearby on his signature pick. So the totem battle goes over to the Leviathan soul laner this time. Fine, okay. Finally starting to get the better end of the trades up against Sot. It wasn't looking great in that level two, level three. But once that first transformation falls through, once Fine OK gets access to his whole kit, makes this matchup just a little bit easier from over in that lane. Certainly does. Panda Cap getting the better end of the trade over on left. This on her is a pick that has been pretty consistently taken away from most ADCs so far in this tournament. For this reason, you're going to walk up to buffs. You're going to threaten just about everyone in the 1v1. And you have to sort of concede that pressure as to not get just a Desert Fury or an Impale to the face. But no ultimates to use it. This is what I'm talking about. Panatom has that same level of aggression, right? He could blink in, go for a nice drop kick, Winds of Smash. That's available at any moment. But Adaptic could do it from so far away. So I expected to see just a bit more from the Anvil of Dawn. It's not as if he's only level six, right? He hasn't had it for that long. But maybe he's waiting to finish that first item. That could be the difference maker. If he goes in for that Jotun's Wrath, gets the CDR online, and then he can send out that ultimate even faster. I wonder what that first quest item will be for the Gilgamesh as well. It's been so long since so he's really seen him in the meta, so sometimes you forget. You get a free tier one item. I wonder where it even stands for tier How one deep? magical defense. Magic defense is the call. I'm going to go with something in the blade trees. I'm going to go that that ancient blade. It will be my guess. We're both wrong. Instead, it's damage. Transcendence Unlucky. tree will be the call. But hold on to it for now. So a little bit of extra power to that drop kick, which gets used against Shinto. Oh, me and Old Town, but now he's a massive dunk by adapting. You step up to Shinto, you mess with the king. I mean, he could have blinked in for that drop kick, but felt he could just close the gap immediately immune out. I think Shinto might have had the damage to do it himself, but adapting said, get away from my mid laner. First blood goes over towards Shinto. Might be the worst character on the map to give that first blood to. Maman with a lead. That's some scary stuff. Right, Pagan's already been sitting under tier one tower this whole game. Now there's no chance that he steps up anywhere near Shinto. Fortunate for him, there's no ultimate for a little while, but Shinto's more than willing to take this level of trade and getting that first dunk by adapting is a great start for the Leviathans. Put themselves on it. the board. And it'll be a nice little totem there for Final K. Even taunts him really playing up to the crowd. Yep. Zot. Nothing you can do about it. Eagles Rally wasted on that ultimate. And not only is Eagles Rally down, now Sot's line of safety is going to be down as well. The teleport available for Fine. Okay, he's getting the better end of this lane, especially early on. And that is going to happen if you are going to go not death toll. You know, you're going to go that Warrior's Act. You're going to lose a bit of your sustain potential. But I still think that the Leviathans could be sending Fine OK over pretty early on. Uh-oh, Panda Cat jump. There's his ultimate in response. Used the beads to walk to the pillar, but Netrio has got an ult for him in the back pocket. The Oni Warriors now on the board. Panda Thomas spot out Shinto. Drop kick slams him against the wall. Shinto throws the ultimate. It's jumped over by the Panda Thomas. The wins of Shamash to lock him in. He's just going to bounce off of the sand walls right into the waiting arm to the mid laner, Pagon. And adapting was up in the sky. Wanted to see if he could save him, but there was no target to look for Panda Cat, a curious up-down, right? That ultimate didn't seem like it was necessary, but you get trapped in the cage, and that's going to be some problem. So well played by Genetics, well played 
by Netrioi, the back and forth brawl. SRT might have overextended for that totem. He's got his ultimate available, he jumps in place, adapting his near, but so is Panatom. Dropkick is available, but he misses a quick teleport out by adapting, and a fast dash by Final K. Bail both the Leviathans out. That could have been dangerous for both parties involved. Yeah, but Saad does what it takes to confirm that totem for his team and for this crowd. The Oni Warriors make out just a little bit better as far as kills go. The Leviathans are going to maintain that farm lead, that gold lead, just by nature of quick farming and better last hits. And of course, the invades that have been happening. But at this point, this has been a lot of action, j -Mag. Not necessarily kills flying through, some low health bars for sure. Now he's going to take a breath, right? You don't, you know, the ultimates are down for a bit. That was a beautiful play by Panatom. He's been looking for Shinto consistently because Shinto doesn't have the beads, right? One drop kick was enough to just crack that fight wide open. So you find the pick. And then immediately after, even more action flying, even more sparks flying over on the right side of the map. Adapting new without Anvil of Dawn, it was going to be difficult to find a kill, but the Juke Shoes came through and that hammer teleport makes sure that he doesn't fall down. Shinto clears out the mid Harpy camp. Well, Doug knows what the crowd wants. The crowd wants totems, and Final K is more than willing to give the crowd exactly what they want. Make sure he can secure that for his team once more. Leviathan down in kills, but still ahead slightly in the gold. Just off that natural farm, that soul lane difference right now in those totems. is net in the Leviathan's about the 900 gold lead, though experience still very close between these two teams. I'm looking towards the objectives. We got some time before the beacon spawns in, and Gold Fury doesn't seem too plausible. I don't imagine that you're going in for a gold at this point. There's plenty of damage on both sides, but it's going to take a bit before you have the damage to actually burn through one of these objectives, right? I mean, I'm looking towards Shinto. He's got a bit. That Bancroft's Talon will help, but the burst is still a topic of conversation. The Thoth is no longer in play here for the Leviathan, so if you're looking towards burst, sure, Shinto's got like his ult, but I'm thinking an impale from Pan the Cat might be your best option, which is not much to count on. Look, if I've already learned anything in this set, doesn't matter how much damage you have on one side, anything yep. can steal an objective away. I mean, we saw a Panda Cat just do it last game with a single basic attack in front of three Runic Bombs that were down from the enemy team. So at this point, you might as well just kill the enemy team if you want to go for an objective. That's about the, the only easy way you can guarantee one for yourself. Yeah, but teleports have been upgraded halfway for both Sot and Fino at any moment. Go back to base, fully upgrade it, show up in duo lane, right? That's been a play that a lot of these solo laners have liked to go to, sort of surprise you, and it can open up a Gold Fury fight like that. I would bet Fine OK more apt to go for it at this case because he's got a bit of a lead itemization-wise, and the Kakolin is just a great team fight tool, right? That big knockup is exactly what you're looking for to set up for the rest of your squad. Well, we'll have to see exactly what these two teams can really bring out here in game number two. Because game one felt so close the whole way through. Oni Warriors, I think the furthest they got was about five, maybe 6,000 gold up. Leviathan's able to close that out after stealing the Fire Giant. But the game was so even at that point that trying to take a fight around those Phoenixes wasn't a guarantee for any of these teams. There's a great defense by the Oni Warriors then. And at the pacing that we're setting now, we're looking to maybe hit that same level. Yep, I mean, looking towards the late game, but of course, the junglers still, the target demographic, right? They are the ones who are going to be initiating this fight, adapting, and Panatom, more so Panatom as of recently. Those drop kicks have been explosive, trying to engage on just about anyone, mostly Shinto, but Shinto's also close to 12, right? That's a big deal. Getting beads online would certainly help him and make him feel just a bit safer in lane, and we've barely seen Pagan, right? This man has been pushed underneath tower for the majority of this game so far. I agree with that sign. Yep. Show some love for Kabam. Show some love for the admins, the people behind the scenes that you don't get to see very often during events like this, even during our regular season, who really help to kind of put everything like this together and to keep everything in check, making sure that everything is going right for the players, whether it be in the booth, behind the scenes. We love the guys out there who are really working where, again, you don't get to see these guys. Sure, we're out here on the camera. All that's nice and great, but oh my you got to help them out. That is... That is some insane artwork. You should be putting that on the table out there. That way it's displayed in front of everybody. I that is nuts. I couldn't trace that. You could have given me that exact <laughs> thing, and I couldn't create that Leviathan sign. You got to get some points. Let's put, put your hands together for that, right? I mean, that's yeah. a great artistic talent yeah, right let's there. Let's give a hand for the artists in the community. We've seen some fantastic art on the signs out there. We've seen a little bit of memes coming through, but artwork like that always gives that experience of vision. Also, most makes me realize, maybe I should have stuck with art a long time ago. I gave that up, and I decided to go into electrical. And then I gave that up and decided to come here. Well, hey, <laughs> you're great at this. I don't know how good of an artist you are, but I can tell you. I was not a good artist. I'll okay. tell you that. I'm way better at doing this than doing art. <laughs> All right, you stick to casting, man. And hey, I'll do the same. Hopefully, get back into this game in just a second, and then we can both stick to casting this set. Man.
it's a great set, hopefully, to continue forward. Really want to see the action that these two teams can bring. Again, it's the number two seed in the Leviathans, the number three Oni Warriors. The position that these two teams got in was because of the win for the Leviathans, able to put themselves in that finals at the playoffs to go for that second seed and a five-game set that it went between these two teams in order to put the Oni Warriors down in the third place. Charlie, you got a Bacchus tattoo somewhere? Nope. No? Nope. I don't know about that. I don't, they, I don't think they would hold a sign if you didn't have one, Trelly. I, I don't know what they're talking about. <laughs> you do not have one. J-Mac, there is a garment of clothing that would have to be removed. I don't think we'd be able to do that in that we case. Would be, th this stream would be <laughs> taken down immediately. <laughs> nope. So unfortunately, can't show it here on broadcast. Can't promise anything off broadcast, but can't show it here this time. Man, they're really excited to be able to see that tattoo. I believe them. It might make their day, but nope. Not able to show that here. <laughs> Wouldn't make it, I think, everybody's day. Being able to kind of jump up into this one more than anything. Leviathans, the only Warriors, we're so excited to see what these two teams are capable of in this full game distance. I mean, we've already gotten a reverse sweep at the World Finals in our very first semifinal. It's not something that we get to see very often happen at all, but the fact that it happens at World sends the Dragons to the Grand Finals and now awaiting their opponent between these two matchups. We are going to take a quick break here so we can start out some of the audio issues we're having up on stage. We'll be back with game number two. Welcome back, Smite fans. Fingers crossed that we can get back here into game number two as we continue to iron out some of the audiences that we've been having with the players up on stage. The Leviathans and the Oni Warriors, we're ready to jump ourselves back in to game number two. Not much has changed since that last we saw these two squads up. Still one to two on that kill count. Oni Warriors keeping it even though as far as gold, just that first blood bounty really separating these two teams. Yeah, and we're still looking towards those junglers. Blink down from Panatom, so he can't really get aggressive for the next 20 seconds or so, but adapting. He lost his beads a bit ago and doesn't really want to go in for an Anvil of Dawn without that survivability, but you don't need to go in for an Anvil of Dawn if you're looking towards SOT. It was close by, but it's not charged this one up yet. Maybe just waiting. Oh, the charge comes through, but I don't know if this is a great call. 
Uh, it's not a fight for anything else, but a dunk by adapting might just end the life of Solar Troll. Eagles rally away. Final K pushes him against the wall. Body wow. blocks, slams down. Final K with his first kill of the game. I really thought Sot would be able to hear the ult from that close, but no, he was none the wiser, did not get the Eagles rally in time. Wasn't able to react full go for it, just forgot that Adapted could be close by, and that was a beautiful chain CC. Fine, okay. Finally getting on the board here in game number two. Evening up the kills, and of course the Leviathans have been getting the better end of the farm pretty consistently throughout the entirety of this game. But this was another play that kept happening. Shito was the target of Panatom, just takes the ult. There was no beads to be used because Shito felt like he was just fine. It's the ultimate. Keeps himself away for the time being, but that's now a tier one tower taken away from Shinto at only 10 minutes in the game. That is an early structure removed and a lot of safety now taken away from this Mamon. We've been seeing Shinto just use his ultimate to immune out a lot of his CC. Still has access to beads, but this gives Panatom so many more avenues to get in that lane. And that's the thing, Mamon is not a mid laner, right? She's made for the jungle. Her clear on actual waves is a bit difficult, so you can't step up to Pagon. He's gonna out clear you just about every single time. And then you gotta watch out for your tower, which did just drop. But with that, though, look at this. Shinto hovering over in solo lane. Does not want to go in for anything, because Sot knows there's someone nearby. Even so, though, we talked about burn towards these objectives. The Gold Fury is definitely something that could be gone for. But with the beacon spawning in here in about 50 seconds, I want to see both of these teams group up. It's not as if this game is not even, right? The Leviathans have a small lead, but the Oni Warriors could still certainly put up a fight here. Beacon will spawn up right as that teleport comes available to SOT. Meanwhile, Final K holding on to his just in case there does need to be a rotation for him. Without that tier one tower, though, makes it a bit dicier for the Leviathans to step forward. They don't have a safe place to retreat back to should the fight go awry, at least against themselves. The Oni Warriors could be playing with a, a little bit of extra momentum now knowing that there's no safe spot for the Leviathans to go if they can get the upper hand. 20 seconds till we get a little bit more time towards that beacon. And again, Leviathans are still commanding, right? They're stepping forward, they're feeling more confident, but Pagon's getting his itemization online. That Book of Thoth already evolved and stacked up with the Divine Ruin. This Merlon is gonna have a good bit of damage. I wanna see more from Wrong Yu though, right? He's got the blink, he's upgraded it. This Kuzumbo could start a fight at any moment, but hasn't really had the opportunity to do so ever since that one assist. And it looks like the beacon is gonna go the majority of the way to the Warriors before Leviathans finally show up. And here comes Panacat. He makes the rotation all the way over. The Panatom's here as well, adapting it to wall of one. Panatom jumps to the wall, kicks wrong you into it. And that will be the retreat call for the Leviathans. Don't want to stick around too long with four, Here's but Fino. now it's fine. Okay, on the way, it could be a collapse on the Panatom. Could be a collapse against the Warriors, but the deed is already done. The beacon, the first one of the game, goes over to the Oni Warriors. Yeah, with both teleports used, you'd think a little bit more would come through, but both teams respecting that final king and respecting that SOT have shown up. They're just gonna concede and give up the aggression. It was close, though. If that wall connects from adapting and then Panicat's there for the follow-up, maybe a little bit more action towards that beacon, but that's all we're gonna see for now. A little bit of grouping over towards left lane. Remember, towers have been the Oni Warriors' target. They were already able to grab the tier one in mid, but Pyromancer spawns in here shortly. Could be something that the Warriors look towards, but they're more so grouping on the left side than that. Final K wants to stop this totem. I don't think he can stop SOT from taking it this time. So the Oni Warriors can bank on at least their third totem of the game, but now it it's a fight around Gold Fury. Nearly half HP taken away from the objective before the Warriors get sniffed out. That vision inside of the pit gives the clue over to the Leviathan. Says, hey, there's somebody over here. They're able to rotate just in time to slow that one and even stop it for the time being. That's it for now. A little bit of an action towards the Pyromancer. The Leviathans look towards it. Shinto went for it, decided, no, we're not having any damage coming this way. But pay attention to the ADCs. If Netroid and Panda can't leave at any moment, it means Pyromancer is on their mind. This is an objective that can open up so many doors. We've seen the Runic Bombs be a big topic of conversation. We talked about it last game. Three Runic Bombs, not enough to confirm that Fire Giant. But still, the Towers, I think Structures is the preferred use, right? You drop it on a Tier 2, you drop it on a Phoenix, your life gets a lot easier towards those Sieges. Now it's here still up, but no one really trying to pull it this time. The only Warriors grabbed it, realized that they didn't have too much. We'll be going over to these Pyromans. It might be a while before we really get to see a, a brawl around one of these objectives. This is about the most action that we're going to see throughout the course of any of these early games, it seems. The totem 
has been the crowd favorite over the course of this weekend. It's been a lot of fun for the Soul Inners to poke fun at each other and go for some taunts, go for these totem kills, and really try and set themselves apart from the rest. Yeah, but that's going to be it for now. And Pyro and Golden are still available. It looks like late game, both teams just feel confident, right? That's the only reason that you would be going in. And was that a bolt? That was a bolt emote. <laughs> that was a bolt emote from SOT showing some love. But again, if you aren't forcing the objective, if you aren't looking for aggression, that means you're okay with this game stalling out a bit. That means both of these teams feel like their late game is just fine. And if you want to break it down, Netroid's going to have a, better, a little bit of a better time than Panda Cat, right? Hachiman just scales better. So on her, we'll lose a bit of his effectiveness as the game continues. But Shinto and Pagon, I, I like to think Merlin's a bit easier to play, right? You can kind of just spam all your abilities and know you're doing things, whereas Shinto has to know exactly when he's using his abilities and, you know, cannot waste one of them. Either way, they both don't mind getting late, late game. I would argue that Panatom is going to have a bit of fall off, especially because he's building a little bit tanky, right? He's going like the Shoguns and the Phalanx. But with Bumba's hammer, we've seen Gilgamesh do some disgusting amounts of damage later on. I was going to see, really, more than anything, what this Kuzumbo can do, because we haven't seen wrong you do much of anything just yet. A lot of paddling over in dual lane, some skirmishes towards mid, but haven't really seen the impact that I'd be expecting from this Kuzumbo just yet. So, gotta see what wrong you can get going as the game continues to go on. By the way, that totem goes over to SOT, nearly tying up the two of them if you're keeping count on that one. But and I'm just waiting for the moment. If they're gonna push to late game, Kuzumbo takes a lot of damage because he's one of those gods. You wanna sit in the front line, you wanna soak damage, but with the way that builds have been going, he's not gonna be able to take too much. Yeah, wrong. He's got the spirit robe, so any bit of CC comes his way will make him a bit tankier. Those mitigations will start to add up. But Netroid has been getting the better end of this lane so far. Has the level lead. It was a two level lead and still is, but I assume Panda Cat's close. Genetics drops that ult. Don't imagine much comes from it just yet. Just a little bit of an invade. Actually, both ultimates there coming through just to try and get some action going. Panda Cat's going to lose his form of CC immunity. But Adapting looked by and off. Wanted to go for Anvil of Dawn. Saw no action. And we will continue our, our standoff where no one is pulling the trigger just yet. He's going towards farm and sort of going through the motions of an engage. Look at the lead that's starting to develop for both members of the duel lane. We'll hold that thought as the Gold Fury is picked up by the Leviathan. Genex is here. They know the Dharmic Pillar is down. The Sun's there, but it's Eagles rallying the back by SOT. A fast stun from adapting saves the life of Panda Cat. But SOT he just continues to walk down the Leviathan while the Oni Warriors get a chance to group up around Fury. They're here, Netroid's playing zone duty as the ADC, no less, but Adapting's nearby. Good double tap, misses Netroid. Gets to save his half of his HP bar, but it looks like the only warriors are gonna head in for this Pyromancer. It's only Shinto, but fine, okay. And we in the back line, Zeus Pagon is gonna put a stop to it. No objectives are gonna be committed to just yet. Just gonna be another double down. This game is essentially dead even. You brought it up, the XP is a little bit wishy-washy. Panda Cat's a bit behind, Wrong Yu is a bit behind, but it's going to be made up for throughout the entirety of this map, so not going to be the biggest deal. And now, once those upgraded starter items come through, that might be when the XP starts to hurt a bit. And that's when we really see those big power spikes between these players as well. With the pacing that we have set, it seems like the mid laners might be the first ones to be able to pick that ones up. For now, though, we just wait. We're, we're essentially playing the waiting game until one team decides that they want to either go for a team fight or go for an objective. We've seen a couple of pulls around Gold Fury. We saw the attempted start at Pyro, but these soul laners quick on their teleports. This is something that we've talked about in game number one, and that was talked about with the desk. Is these teleports are being upgraded so much earlier than we're normally used to that it's kind of forcing these weird moments at these different objectives. Grouping up towards Pyro, though, we see a little bit of action. You can see SOT. Shows up just to show some face towards the objective. And yeah, Panatom leaps forward. Look at the rotation Netroids made. Panacat's nowhere to be seen. This should be an attempt, but even with the blink and the Oni Warriors pick it up. Fine, okay, trying to get some action done. A dunk in by adapting and hits Solar or Troll, but that's not the ideal target. The wall, the double tap, it speeds and Aegis out. And Netroid is able to get bailed out by the rest of his team. Final K trying to kill him off in the back line, but it's adapting who goes down first. And Final K after three kills for the Oni Warriors and a Pyromancer. The Leviathans are crumbling at their hands. I mean, that was the rotation difference. Netroid was there so much earlier when you know that Panacat's on the left side of the map. I don't think you should be blinking in. Wrong you just went in for a low stake steal, but it was the Anvil of Dawn. It was the blink in from Final Care, not the blink, just the engage rather. And of course, Shinto 
blinked in trying to find some of that follow-up just did not come through and the Oni Warriors make out like bandits. You get that runic bomb and now this is what I was talking about last game. They're gonna go for a very early fire pull. Darmic Pillars back up soon for genetics, but I don't think any That's of the Leviathans it. are even know this is happening or even gonna try and stop this one. It'll be a 19 and a half minute fire giant for the Oni Warriors. It was a dead even game going into that last team fight, but now the doors have been swung wide open for the Oni Warriors. Fire Giant on all five, and the Gold Fury started by Leviathans. Will the Warriors realize in time that this is being done? Can they get there fast enough, adapting, zoning out, and buying his team just enough time to get that Gold Fury sought? It's just a little too late. Yeah, but SOT did have the Eagles rally, so isn't in too much trouble here, but you gotta let the Gold Fury go down. Just be happy that you got the ultimate. Beautiful wall there, and the pillar, just to make sure that Sot had to waste that Eagles rally. Could have been in a bit more danger. But as you said, Fire Giant on all five. The Oni Warriors can take their pick where they want to go. Usually it's gonna be left lane, but there are options as far as where they want to go and push some of these towers down. And remember, Panatom already has that Runic Bomb in tow. He can just go destroy one of these tier twos. And that would really break this gold lead wide open. It's still very close. The Oni Warriors have built up a bit of a lead for themselves, but getting FG this early on, that's when you start building your 8K, 9K, 10K gold leads. And they've got plenty of towers to do just that. Three tier twos and a tier one over in duo lane for the Oni Warriors to start knocking down. You can see their group up to the left side of the map already. The Leviathans grouping up in mid though, maybe not knowing exactly where the Oni Warriors want to go with their push. Do you defend the middle? Do you defend the left side? Oni Warriors about to show their entire team on that left side of the map. Minus Solar Troll walking up through mid, but teleport is available to him. Can rejoin the action at any moment. Impaled by Panacat, nice, but now does not have that for when Panatom jumps at him. Fortunate, the Panatom at least doesn't want to continue that fight, just scare Panacat back to the tower. And that's the other thing. The you Leviathans know, know that this push is happening. They know the left lane is the target, so they try to split push, but SOT immediately stopped everything in the mid lane. You see a bit of a grouping towards the tier two, as if the Le Leviathans feel as if they can defend here. They don't think this gold lead is so Im insurmountable that they can't step forward. It would have to be quite the engage, though. The blink from Wrong Yu is available. He's got thorns as well, so the Kuzubo could disrupt the back line. But just look at the XP differential, man. Netroid has plenty of damage online, and Darvin Pillars breaks this fight open. Fine, okay. Getting pushed against the wall by Panatom. He'll jump back to the rest of the team, and the tier two tower goes down. Meanwhile, Sot's 1v1ing, adapting in the jungle and not allowing the king to get back to the rest of his team. Tier two and left goes down, still two more standing, but the Oni Warriors, they've got some level 20 power spikes, and if they've got enough gold in hand, once a couple players get that extra 100 gold they need to do so, we'll start hitting those starter items on both of the carries. They've got a minute 20 left. They still could go for one more tier two at the very least with this fire giant buff, but something I noticed there, Pagon's starting to cook. You can tell this Merlin is getting online. The Soul Reaver already finished up that Divine Ruin, of course, and an alternate timeline purchased. That means that reset is going to be very impactful. It's already difficult enough to kill him once. He's 1-0 and 3. Tried doing it twice with not too much burst damage. Could be an issue depending on how out of position Pagon really is. But with Pyromancer up, the Leviathans know, let's stay away from the right side of the map because that's where the majority of the Oni Warriors will be chilling. I do think that mid-tier 2 should be the target, though. They've got enough time to go for this. Tier 2 threatened by Panda Cat. Panatom jumps over the wall, shows some presence, and oh, now hold up. the Leviathans back away, but Sot's in the middle of four of them. Gets the Aegis away from Panda Cat already. Final K gonna try and bail him out, and with the frontliners just diving in, Sot has found Panda Cat. He goes down, and one gone, and Final K can't get out. The fire is too hot, and the Leviathans are starting to fall apart, adapting. Gets a nice wall to hold them back as Wrong Yu tries to return to base. It'll be a three versus five defense for the Leviathans. They've got two Runic Bombs this Phoenix is going to be an afterthought. They're not retreating, J-Mac. They're stepping forward. And Bill of Dawn still available for adapting. Ultimate online for Shinto. The dive is in. Panatom goes to the drop kick, but Shinto's got to go back to the fountain. And the Zot gets pushed inside of the fountain, and he goes down as a kill for Shinto. And adapting has done what he can to hold it back. Does Shinto have the damage to stop four of them? No the way. Titan is low, but the Oni Warriors are not going to give up. The Leviathans need the extra oh push, goodness. but they just don't have it. The Oni Warriors go up 2-0. I mean, I cannot believe they have the damage damage for that Titan. Even after Sock gets pushed under well, I felt like that siege would fall apart at the seams, but Pagon on this Merlin 
brings nothing but Titan Burn, right? He had so much DPS, and of course, it helps that Netroid still had the Gooseberries. Those AoE auto attacks, even if they're getting body blocked, you're gonna find some DPS. That was a very quick and concise game number two. And if I'm the Leviathan, I'm starting to sweat a bit. And I think that's a massive point to bring up is we're at the point of the game where like recipes are still very much active for everybody, not a single Fifth item really being finished up there. The sixth item's not even a thought at that point. Yep. The only Warriors just got an unexpected pick or two and decided, what can we do with this? I wasn't expecting Titan to be the final end call. I mean, with two rooting, and that's what these Pyromancers are so important. If that Phoenix takes longer to go down, the Titan is not an option, right? It just takes too long. You, your, your tanks are getting weak. You can't go for it, but having two Runic Bombs means the Phoenix died in an instant, and then, hey, we've got 30 seconds. Maybe we do go in for that Titan end call, and they had the damage. It looked risky, but it wasn't even that close. Especially with Sot going down, it became even more questionable. Like, how much damage do they really have with their solo laner gone? With adapting using his ultimate, Shinto had to use it just to get back to the well at that point. It is wild that the damage output was just enough for the Oni Warriors to close this one out. Yep, and that shows confidence as well. That's a play that could have easily blown up in your face, but... They were calculated, they knew how much DPS they had, and they never overextended. The Oni Warriors now up 2-0 in the semifinals, one game away from going to Grand Finals to face against the Jade Dragons. Will they make it there, or will it be a bounce back from the Leviathans? We'll find out in game number three, right after this break.
Oh, look at that. We're on the big screen again. What's good? Welcome back to SWC. People still going nuts. It's been an incredible Saturday. And uh, it's an incredible Saturday because of the incredible people. And there are people on stage, actually, believe it or not, that are incredible as well. So I'm joined here by Trelly's family, actually. Why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself? Hi, I'm Trelly's dad, Will. I'm Trina. And then we have, we have the grandparents down over here, hard to reach, but big family stuff. And talk, talk about hard to reach. You guys are traveling from a long way to get here. Tell me a little bit about the support that you uh, have given to Trelly over his career as on whatever we do here. We've supported him for 10 years in this. He's loved this game. He's loved high res and, and he loves broadcasting. Yeah. I think the years of him yelling at his screen have paid off. I mean, the love here is, is, is certainly real. When you, have a, when, you, when you have a kid like Trelly, I think there's obviously some sort of charisma. There's something obvious that he's destined for, I hope he doesn't hear me, but like greatness, you know? Uh, when was it that you went, all right, he's going to do something big? I'll let you answer that. I mean, he has always been, had a big heart, and when he put his mind to something, he put his whole self into it, and I think it's evident and clear that he loves this game. And um, I think that we've got a lot of fans come up to us and say, you're Trelly's parents. He's a great caster, but he's also someone we can learn from because of the way he casts. And I mean, I, I, I certainly have to agree. I've been out of it for a little while, and it's, and it's Trelly who I listen to, because he, you know, all the chair ones, the play-by-plays, they don't actually know the game for sure. It's always the analysts, the chair twos. And so he's the one I've got to listen to to learn. But, you know, kind of to wrap this up, I, I, talk to me a little bit about the experience. You mentioned that, you know, fans have come up to you and this, that, and the third. But, uh, you know, is that something, is that just normal? Or, or you know, how do you, does that make you feel when you see the love that everybody has for, for your son? It, it is normal. I, I, Anthony, whatever he set his, his mind to, he puts in 100%, right? And, and he's very engrossed in his career and, and, and Smite and high res and, and, and this tournament. He loves it, yeah. Well, we certainly love him and everything that he's been able to bring. Certainly a big part of the family and you as well are part of our family. So thank you so much for being here. Year 10 of Smite wouldn't be the same without you and what you've been able to do with us. So. Thank you. We love you. And we still got a hell of a lot of games to play. So let's roll. Goodness gracious, we got a lot of family support in the arena here today. <laughs> I want to tear up a little bit. I I'm know. <laughs> I love his parents now. I know. I mean, you, you love the support. And I don't even like that guy that much. <laughs> <laughs> everything we do, all the players, everyone at home who's playing Smite, every, everyone has the parents who had to deal with them in their bedrooms, yelling at their games, and, and so everyone and their parents can understand uh, a little bit of the yelling at the screen type stuff that they were talking about. Don't know what FDOT was talking about, only the chair ones don't know the game. I know I got three chair twos glaring at me right now, and maybe FDOT's onto something there. We'll look back at the Steel Series moments of glory from game number two as the Oni Warriors have taken a 2-0 lead over the Atlantis Leviathans. Inbound, I'll come to you first. What's the synopsis of game two? I'm in love with this Merlin pick. We saw it last set, and it's been doing a lot. It's, it's not even like a late game, like pop-off character. We only got to 23 minutes, and he was able to put up a lot of damage. And you really don't have to pair it with that much. It just seems to be very safe. It seems to get a lot of damage off. The build right now for him is incredible. and. It also is just a very safe pick in what it can do. So it's hard to punish, it does a lot of damage, and it fits into most comps. I think that means it's a very strong pick, and I I'm, want to see it like maybe picked earlier or maybe even banned away. Yeah, the Merlin was fantastic, and we saw three bands aimed at genetics in the first three band slots for the Leviathans, and he gets this Ganesh. And Oxy, you might want to close genetics ear here, make sure he can't hear this, but that guy went absolutely crazy on this pick. The ego on him is unreal, but perhaps earned. Even when he goes down to picks, he's getting denied what's considered his best picks. He has this Ganesh and he plays absolutely fantastic. The ults were perfect this game. Miff, do you feel like the Leviathans have swung for two different compositions now or come up empty handed through two games? What's left for this team to try? Literally anything else, I suppose, <laughs> besides what For we've sure. already seen. I mean, meeting the Oni Warriors in the early game is always a daunting task, but when you lose out in a match like you just did, 
you, you got to realize if we don't meet them at the early, they're going to transition to that mid to late or maybe not even the late, considering how quick we had just seen that game cleared out, that uh, I think you have to. You, you just have to play them in that early game. Maybe put adapting on something like the Awheelish. It doesn't have to be the Awheelish, but something like it that can act as that bridge pick, facilitate the rest of the team. And I have to agree. I think they have to switch something up here. First two comps haven't worked out. You got to try something else. But we just saw this in the previous set. It was a down 2 0. They tried a few different comps, didn't work out. And going into the third comp, I mean, they tried something else and then it ended up working out really well. So they just switched something up. I like the Awilix. I also think. Let's stop banning genetics. He's going to play something. He's going to play it well. It's impossible. It, 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 you cannot ban him out. Just let him have whatever he wants, and then you just pick the prio gods after that. Give him whatever he wants, and then just make sure you get your own support of strong god. I don't love the Kuzumbo. I didn't love the Kuzumbo. It just doesn't fit enough with what they want to do. So just make sure you get a strong guardian that can match him. I think the dual lane in general there was something I didn't love. This and her, it's been banned away from Panda Cat, but we saw in that first replay in the Moments of Glory, he jumps in, gets dashed on by Netriod on the Hatchy Man, the gank comes in and he immediately falls. And I think he was low its damage in the whole game there. Yep. Certainly below the Kuzumbo, 4.5k. Uh, it's just too, too low for such a priority pick. I want to see Panda Cat and Rongyu switch it up in these picks and bans. Inbound, you said, you know, we saw this last set. Are you saying we got three more games than okay, us before? Well, okay, well, okay. <laughs> Maybe we can go five, but uh, I'm not calling it yet because uh, these P's and B's are going to be very important because uh -huh. we saw a big switch up from the Dragons. And so far, Warriors taking that first side, switching it up a little bit, also straying away from the bands of okay. genetics, which I really like, and sticking towards these jungle bands, try to get adapting onto something a little bit more uncomfortable. Uh, I mean, the, the potential here, Afro, Ganesh, or Afro, Ganesh, um, Kepri, Yemoja, a ton of good supports available here. I like the switch up so far, though. We were hoping to move away from the genetics bands a little bit. Mifflin, there is still an Athena band that's expected to come through, no matter what support is playing. Rare Kabam appearance. Love that for us. When you don't ban out genetics, you, you tend to leave something open. It's an Odin ban, though, for the Atlantis Leviathans. Is this the type of direction you're happy to see in the first three? I think limiting SOT is decent, but that's not one of SOT's bread and butter, just I'm going to bully you in lane style picks. I think it's more so the Leviathans trying to address a certain type of composition from the Oni Warriors. Don't want to deal with that zone that we saw around objectives, so address the Odin. Athena is just a, a band that has to happen. It seems like that god just incredibly valuable at every facet of the game. But I, I think the adaptations from the Leviathans and straying away from genetics bands, of course, just incredibly smart. He is, at the last Worlds run we watched, the most target ban player at the event full stop, and he was always playing something that was looking incredibly good. How much worse is his fifth best pick than his first? I, I think that guy really does have a, a mastery over the Guardian tab. This is smart from the Oni Warriors, just continue to feed the hot hand, and the hot hand's the early game on her, dominates the duo. Worth mentioning, going back to last year, this is just a fun stat that I was thinking of. We're talking about genetics a lot, and we're, we're, we're hoping if we're Leviathans fans, we're gonna get three straight. Gotta start here in game three. Think about this though, genetics going back to last year on the Kings, two games in a row in quarters, three games in a row in semis, three in a row in finals. That's a total of eight straight Worlds games without a loss. This year, two in quarters, two in semis. He has gone, what is that? 12. 12 straight games on the world stage without dropping a single one. Heck of a stat from Genetics. Leviathans are going to have to change history around a little bit in game number three. On her to start off for the Oni Warriors. Hazer, what are you hoping to see for the Leviathans? Yeah, I'm kind of torn here. I would quite like to see Pegon forced off of this Merlin pick, but I'm not sure I want to top two it the Leviathans because I'm worried about, you know, an Ares, a, a Daji, anything that punishes that lack of CC immunity. Maybe one way to combat that could be the Afro. They decide to take that early for the Leviathans. And the other hover, Vulcan, we saw this band away from Paul wow. repeatedly in the last set. Shinto about to show us what it's made of. And this is something where we've seen it a little bit, mostly in bands. We haven't really seen it played too much, but it, it buys Mirrodin well. It's got a good build path right now with Book. It can go into that alternate timeline, build that more tankier style. And it pairs really well with Aphrodite because it allows you to kind of just run it down. <laughs> twice, still doesn't twice. Hit totem. Making sure we know that Myth doesn't hit totem. And, and I really like <laughs> just like the pairing of these two together. I think there's a lot of survivability and a lot of damage out of these two. 
Yomoja pick incredibly smart. I hit totems, by the way. Yomoja pick uh, incredibly nice. smart there. I, I think Good on you. Tiamat, not exactly what I was expecting from the Oni Warriors, not exactly that, that early game aggression that I, I would associate with them throughout the this set, but Yomoja has a direct answer to the Vulcan, just lock him down, largely a mobile mage, and the, the healing to match up against Aphrodite on the other side. Makes a good deal of sense here, and even the Amaterasu who picked into the Yomoja, I don't think plays very well into it. And I think we found the style that the Levi's are going for in this third game. Game one, they wanted the beads burn comp. They wanted to try to pull those beads, punish them. Game two, they want to run it down, take those fights. Game three, they're playing these objectives. They're going to look to go to them, burn them, secure them. If you look at the side of the Warriors, <laughs> they don't have that secure. I love Panatom. Yeah, he gets the Mercury banned out against it. He throws up his hands. I guess maybe there was a conversation about picking it earlier on in the draft and he was overruled and now we see <laughs> it banned out. That's that's what it appeared like for me. Yep. Bologna banned away from SOT as well. I like that. I really do like that. I feel like he found a lot of pressure in solo. A good pick into Amaterasu. Does well into Vulcan as well. Difficult for Vulcan to run away from that pick. And Neja is the other target ban here towards adapting. So adapting, no Merc, no Neja. And it looks like he's going towards the nemesis instead nemesis. a pick that has no way out of that yamoja ult so an interesting one for me need to see more from the leviathan's jungler here in game three Oni warrior still a few gaps of course in their roster assuming a jungle and a solo laner inbound are there some obvious choices in your mind for the Warriors, I think a Nike really sticks out right now. It allows them to just give a lot of zoning potential into this Levi's comp. And when they go for those objective fights, the Fire Giant, there's a lot of damage from Fire Giant, and Nike kind of adds into that, where you can't really commit to her, and she does enough damage, she wastes enough time. I think I like the Nike in solo. I think Nike could work, but my eyes also go towards something like Tier for some separation, <laughs> decent lane bully potential, as well as just having so many immobile gods on the other side. Would be a good way to put some disruption into the back line. But also, it's just SOT, and that guy plays tier every given opportunity. Thor as the lock in. <laughs> could be jungle, could be solo. Uh oh, Osiris was still up. What are we doing? We, we, should, we, doing? we should have called it. How yeah, do, how that's do we that? Well, we've been us. calling it. We've been calling it. We've been waiting for it. This whole event, we did. the we Osiris did call from Salt. It finally comes out. Solar Scarabs, Bobby, you probably Love have it. some great memories of playing with this Osiris. Yeah, I mean, if you want a totem, you get solo or troll Osiris, you let him run the game. I mean, you just hope it doesn't go late and then he makes a, a misplay here or there. But I think that Nike for the, the Warriors, I think it works just as well on this Levi's team. I think it gives them that space control. When she is solo diving, you can kind of play that front to back. Oh, it's an armor. Mm. What am I doing? I'm trolling. What are, what are initial? I'll wait until it gets locked in. It's a long day, Bobby. It is a long day. <laughs> but All there right, it what, is. what are initial emotions now? Ula getting locked in, played twice, won once, lost once, inbound. What's the gut feeling? Well, I just missed on the Nike call, so let me let me shoot another shot here. Yeah, please do. They're playing this objective style comp and they lock in this Uller. It doesn't make a ton of sense to me. When you want to play this, this Ama, this Vulcan, Aphrodite even, you're playing for these objectives. You're playing to go to them, secure them, burn them. Uller doesn't add to that. Uller's this, the, this character that plays 1v1s very well, not really a lane dominant character anymore, more, more so plays to that late game. So I don't think it really fits their comp entirely. However, I'll say, last time we saw a Panda Cat on this Uller, dominated, and Hazer and I both said, we didn't like the, the Uller pick, but he, he kind of shut us up a little bit. He kind of dominated. Yeah, the Kron and the Uller last time did a lot of work. This time it's Uller and Afro. There's a lot of single target CC and single target damage in this Atlantis Leviathan's comp, but I wonder who they're intending to burst down. You know, you get an Afro kiss onto Osiris, Yamoja's gonna be playing back, so it's only Osiris is your option. If you Afro kiss Osiris, you Nam ult, you Uller one, you Uller, does he die? I don't really think he does. If Sok goes for the right build and gets a decent lead up in this solo lane, he's gonna be nigh on unkillable. And I'm not sure that this Leviathan's comp has the ability to shut down the backline of the Oni Warriors. I feel like the peel from the Yamoja here is gonna be really, really, really powerful. I actually don't mind how much CC the Leviathans have. They have so much single target CC that I think everyone brings something to the table that it, it's not gonna be that big of a deal. Generally, it's you want at least one guy who can dedicate it, uh, initiate on a two or three targets, but because you've got the knockup, from Vulcan, the stun from Aphrodite, as well as Amaterasu, who can follow up, and the Nemesis is so self-sufficient. The, the single target CC chain is actually very strong from the Leviathans. 
And, and I actually think this Levi's comp fits how I want to see them play in this game. I want to see them grouping up with just the Aphrodite, two men running through the jungle, looking for beads and then looking to punish them, because that's how they're going to kind of snowball this game. If you put this on her behind, we just saw what happens. 4,500 damage in 30 minutes. J-Mac is in sport mode. No. Yeah, yeah, sport just, mode is when... Yeah. They're around the back of your... I don't own a pair of Crocs, so I... Uh, oh, let me tell you about Crocs. Please tell me. We're not sponsored. He was, in, he was in sport mode. <laughs> he was in sport mode. J-Max ready to go. He's thinking we might have three more games to go. And I'm wondering, look, look, look at some of the picks that we analyzed when the J-Dragons turned, thing or, turned things around. We were wondering, okay, maybe now we're starting to get back towards comfort picks. Analytically, they make sense, but also they might just be really good comfort picks for those players. We'll see if the Uller is just that for Panda Cat. Needs to start here for the Atlantis Leviathans. Game number three right now. Backs against the wall for the Atlantis Leviathans. They've got to reverse sweep the Oni Warriors if they want to make it to the grand finals, but it's all got to start here in game number three. It's J-Mac and Shelly here to bring you the action to see if the Leviathans can do just that. Or will the Oni Warriors be able to sweep their way to the grand finals face off against the J-Dragons? The only way to do that is to jump right in to game number three with our two teams. And immediately what sticks out to me, Trelly, Panda Cat going back to this Uller has had mixed success on it so far this tournament. The God in general has had a bit of back and forth. What's your take on the Uller in this comp? Well, I was never a big fan of the Uller. I was not shy about saying it, but I, I tend to disagree a bit with the desk in the sense that I think they've made up for the fact that the Pan that Panic is not going to bring a lot of DPS towards fire by having the Vulcan, by having Fine OK. And honestly, they might go like a Bracer and a Frenzy combo. I've seen that time and time again when the Amaterasu is present. So I think they're trying to let Panda Cat be that, that fragger with the, with the Uller go in for some axes, go in for solo kills, but they still have that damage towards objectives, towards the burst, etc. But I gotta say, J Mag, I don't know, I can't think of a better place I'd rather be than casting this semifinal with you, setting up a possible reverse sweep here for the Leviathans while you're double crocked up. Uh, you got to stay in sports mode for this one, especially if we're thinking that this one is going to go the distance for the Leviathans. But now it all kicks off with the minion spawn between the two teams. We get the Aphrodite back for wrong use, so a bit of pressure, a bit of sustain matched on the opposite side against the Oni Warriors, who went for the Yamoja. Genex has gone this a couple of times so far and has looked absolutely dominant when he gets his hands on this pick and was heralded as one of the best Yamoja players in the world. And getting this in a game three is going to be a tough fight for the Leviathans. Not to mention, you also have Sot on the Osiris. I saw the crowd, they were getting pretty excited about that lock-in because this is a pick where Sot really made his namesake a couple years ago, I believe season eight worlds on the Solar Scarabs. And it, on a team that really had no business going as far as they did in that tournament, as far as everyone was concerned, but they really came together and Sot on this pick absolutely hard carry. So giving them the Osiris, giving Genetics the Yamoja, giving Pagon the Tiamat as well in game number three of this best of five. Scary stuff for the Leviathans. Yeah, it just feels like the Oni Warriors got everything that they wanted in this draft, especially, as you mentioned, the highlight picks for really the support and that solo laner. The Osiris, the Emoja, massive power picks for the Warriors team. But you look over against the Leviathans, able to grab this Amaterasu for Final K, try and get Matt some of that auto attack damage. But more than anything, as kind of mentioned, High by Desk going over towards a bit more of this objective play by having this and the Nemesis, plenty of damage to shred to the objective. Certainly is. Playing it slow though. The turret's gonna help out with just a lot of farming. And of course, another niche interaction. You can just drop the turret at the Bastions, get some extra gold in hand. It will shoot endlessly if Pagan doesn't interrupt it. So Shinto will be focusing pretty much just on farming in the early game. That's the best idea as far as I'm concerned when you lock in a pick like the Vulcan. But with that said, I talked about it a lot last game. This Thor has the ability, level five, when Panatom gets access to Anvil of Dawn, he can get aggressive and notably adapting. Went in for the blink, does not have the beads. If Anvil of Dawn connects, you have plenty of ways to interrupt that shield, but looks like a gank opportunity here for Zod. Falling low, going down, fine, okay, and adapting. Notch first blood for the Atlantis Leviathans in a great spot to put that in as well. Solar Troll has been giving Fino so much trouble in this set, giving it over to the solo laners, gonna expedite and help him out there. And that's the thing, I thought that saw, saw that gank out, right? It wasn't as if adapting was being that sneaky. He sort of walked right past the cooldown buff, but no vision coming his way means that there's gonna be no trouble. Now Panatom over here on this side of the map. Final K gonna dash away from the tether, but blue buff seems to be what they are after. And with adapting going for mid camps, blue buff might be 
going at least a little bit towards the Oni Warriors. What well, that being spotted this on out, so the Sot has to be careful, but I lied. He's just walking forward. They really don't care. It's fours for everybody. Sot actually just hits five just by grabbing a single minion off of that camp. So now the Leviathans are going to be fighting an ultimate deficit to the solo lane. It. Blue buff confirmed for the Oni Warriors, and they're just going to walk right out. They take their prize of the blue buff around Solar Troll's waist. Yeah, I mean, you lose the, the gold bounty of first blood, of course, but Final K still does need the XP, still does need that blue buff. It helps out so much. With Death's Toll, the MP5 is not going to be that big of a deal, but you kind of wish you were able to confirm that 50-50. Like I said, Anatom and Adapting both have the ability to get aggressive. Blinks down for Adapting, whereas Anatom, he's got his beads. He's feeling safe at the moment. But I, I think that in a case like this, where the Oni Warriors just had a fantastic end to their game, they should still be riding that high, right? They should be able to try and just use the momentum they built up so far to get aggressive. So far, has not been the case. A bit of an unplanned, maybe unexpected way to end out game number two as well as a couple of picks around the tier two tower. And then from that point, the Warriors said, why don't we just see how far we can take this? Took them all the way to the Titan room and then ending game number two so much faster than we've really seen any of our games so far this weekend. An unexpected pace that the Warriors were able to set off of what was essentially 20 minutes of a lot of non-fighting happening between these two teams. Yep, and I don't think we're setting up for something different because at the moment it's just been sit at the tower line. Wrong, you and Panda Cat attached at the hip, this Aphrodite. This brings so much safety. It's not as if Netroid and Genetics can go in whenever they want. They have to play around Undying Love. And more specifically, that shield buff spawn, right? That's when the junglers head over to left lane when the shield buff is in play. And since it's not available, tower line is where they will be sitting. Even with a nice kiss into an axe, doesn't seem like there's too much kill potential over on the left side of the map. Most of that action should be happening around mid and, of course, over in the solo lane. But it took some objectives to spawn in before we saw the real sparks flying in game number two. Because of that, just going to the farm game for now. So typically we know Tiamat to be this four or five item god, then she really starts to start hitting pretty hard. Opposite side here for the Vulcan, what's kind of that power spike that Vulcan is looking for before his damage really starts to stack up and come online? I'm a big fan of two item Vulcan. I'm not saying that's when he's online, but that's when you can really go, oh man, I'm chunking, right? You get like a Spear of Deso or Divine Ruin after that Book of Thoth. And that's when that damage really starts hurting the squishier characters. But Staff of Mirrodin, Soul Reaver, Opshard, that's really needed before the tanks feel your damage. Either way, with enough CC, and the Leviathans do have a fair bit, that Earthshaker is going to be chunking just about everyone if you get it a long enough distance. Wall used on fine, okay. Panatom hammers away up into the sky just to retreat, but Sot's not stand giving up. He's going to stand his ground at the enemy blue buff. Dunk on top adapting, but a quick blink gets him away from danger. And now at the back of a peg on the Oni Warriors comfortable stepping up to the blue buff. Not stolen away by the Oni Warriors this time. Fine, okay. Able to solo confirm that for himself. Yep, Final Kick gets that one, and of course, a nice blink from Adapting to make sure that Anvil of Dawn doesn't net any more value. This is what I was talking about, though. Panatom has the ability to look towards Adapting because that beads is not there. As long as you have the blink, you should be able to reaction blink away. You just look at the ground and say, oh, there's a red circle here. I'm about to get dunked on. I should probably run away. But still, that safety is there, and that's why Panatom felt like he could go back in just one more time. Not going to net too much, though. The blue buff attempted invade goes the way of fine. Okay. I wonder if Sock goes into the executioner's second item. That has been the, the, the flavor of the month, as far as I'm concerned, ever since Deathwalker pulled it out. You can really chop up in lane. Usually, final kick goes to that vital amplifier, but they're pretty big power spikes, as far as I'm concerned, damage-wise, with these auto-attack style warriors. Let's see if that ends up being the build for these two solo laners. In the meantime, adapting. He's going to roam through the jungle, clean up any farm that he's able to. And we'll see if he's able to really get involved, get active with the rest of this map. Because it's been a lot of sitting around waiting for somebody else to make a mistake. For Panatom, step too far forward, trade out an ultimate for ultimate in that case. And it feels like for adapting on a pick like Nemesis, it's not necessarily the one that wants to always be starting out these fights. But, I mean, as you highlighted it best, without beads, there's not much that adapting can do if he gets caught out by Panatom. And that's the thing. He's been going for these walls, been going for double taps, hasn't found too much value from it so far. But... You always got to be looking around the corner just in case Panatom is lurking. And Adapting has some decent targets with that ultimate, but I mean, with, with Sot's ult available, it's not as if you can just go in freely. And Genetics has so much movement 
with the Riptides, the slow, isn't necessarily going to matter. It's more about that prot steal. A little bit of a gank attempt here, though, towards Panda Cat, just forcing out everything. Throws the axe into a CCMU target, stuck in a wall, and Genetics will take him down with the bubble. The Oni Warriors dedicate three bodies to take down Panda Cat, but it's just enough for the kill. Not only do they take him out, the beads goes down as well, which opens up the door for Panda Tom. I want to see him head over to left lane and gank off cooldown, right? Anvil of Dawn is still available. The beads for Panda Cat are going to be down for quite some time. Adapting, hovering over and right. Doesn't really have kill potential with Lord of the Afterlife available, so Sot not in too much trouble just yet. But yeah, if I'm if I'm Panda Tom, I'm going to left lane just about now. I want to kill Panda Cat one more time before those beads come back up. Panda Tom's sight set towards blue buff again, but not going to go for the invade this time with SOT, even despite the opportunity to do so. Remember, no beads for adapting, no beads for for fine okay either. Went for that teleport option as most solo laners have opted towards in that first slot. So wonder if Panatom will make that rotation over to the dual lane and try and keep up that pressure on Panda Cat. He's been going for more of what we consider the traditional style of Wooler build. Bluestone into Transcendence. Yeah, but look at this. Teleport already fully upgraded for SOT. Persistent teleport is here. He could show up in duo lane at any moment. As long as there's some ward coverage, Sot could make his presence known. And Panic Cat only gets one jump. If you're getting away, if you're jumping away from the tether, you're getting a Lord of the Afterlife, and vice versa. There's plenty of CC. I wouldn't hate an opportunity towards Gold Fury. You just have to watch out for Shinto, right? This Vulcan is still going to be the big threat on that side of the map. You can't just go in for a Gold Fury if he's within old distance. Nearly at that two item spike you were mentioning earlier for Shinto. Would not hate to see. Maybe some threat towards one of these objectives, this Gold Fury. Ripe and ready for the taking. Leviathan's already starting to group around. Panacat tossed the axe. Gold Fury pulled by Leviathan's, but Panatom is nearby. Tosses out a wall Shinto's way. Just misses the actual stun for the damage, but it's just enough presence and enough threat to keep the Leviathan's from the objective. Yeah, this is not the team that I thought would get aggressive towards the objective, especially with Panacat's beats down. But when you're linked to wrong you, you feel a little bit safer. Fine, okay, makes the rotation over. Thought it was for mid camp, so maybe wants to get that dazzling offensive off to try and look for an ultimate, but not gonna be the case. Just gonna go for some mids, attempting to go in for the steal there. Either way, the Leviathans recognize that Shinto has damage, right? That turret is going to help them out. Shinto has burst, that burst, that ultimate is gonna help them out. So despite being down a bit as far as fighting power, as far as survivability relics, they still feel pretty confident just stepping forward and already Phantom Shell online for Wrong You. That's gonna help out not only with Panatom's walls, but of course the River's Rebuke, right? Genetics has been on point with that ultimate ever since he got his hands on Yumoja, and it doesn't seem like he's gonna be missing anytime soon. Beads now back and available to Panda Cat. Dapping sets the sight to Pagon, but Pagon in the face of three jumps in place. This man goes and doesn't know how to jump out. Now, he, he is all he is in. That's it. He only knows W key at this point. It's always W key at the enemy team. If we could check his keyboard, I bet the S key has just been removed. He cannot jump away. He doesn't have the ability to, and he certainly doesn't want to because Tiamat can just get stronger when you're in that stance. Sure, you're going to lose a bit of damage, but what you're going to gain is that survivability, just a little bit more tank stats. And that's the benefit of a pick like this. You can take it very high in the draft, and Pagon just loves to go to this team, huh? I think Steel Series can make an oops all W key keyboard, give that one over to Pagon, give him that extra little boost of inspiration that he needs. Not that he necessarily needs it, he, but it really he, fits his play style already. He doesn't need it, but he would accept it with open arms, I'm sure. I'm great. I'd be hard pressed to think he wouldn't want something like that. In the same regard that Shinto was on the Thoth, almost playing similar styles where Pagon loves to go in, gets a bit tankier on the Tiamat, where Shinto would be dashing in aggressively with the Thaw, trying to play that frontline style. Can Vulcan play to that similar degree? Is Vulcan one of those gods where you can jump up and run into that frontline for Shinto? You want to be in range of Meatball, and that's about it, right? That That is your play. You, you No closer, no further. In range of Meatball. That is Vulcan's bread and butter. You have the juke potential with Backfire. You have the knockup potential. You can just run around in circles, but if someone's able to close that gap and just connect CC after backfire, then you're kind of stuck, right? You're, you're, you're stuck in place. Panatom has a fantastic matchup into the Vulcan. The wall from a distance is just out of range of Meatball, and more specifically, you could just immune it, right? You have Berserker's Barrage, that knockup immunity can go crazy in these team fights. Finally, 12 minutes has hit, and the beacon has spawned in. Genetics, the first one to stand by. Wrong, you thought about stepping forward. Chinto thought better of it, and they're going to give this beacon up, so the Oni Warriors take that one uncontested. Genetics just stands menacingly on the platform, staring down 
the Leviathans, and that's enough to keep them away. That River's Rebuke was so crucial to getting the kill on Panda Cat the last time over in dual lane. Even with Phantom Shell up, still always that looming threat of Genetic standing nearby, especially if Wrong Yu isn't in the area, could catch somebody out because, as mentioned, Panda Cat's the only one who can reliably get out of the River's Rebuke. If any of these walls go down, every other member of the Leviathans are stuck between them. And as we've seen, it doesn't even, you don't even need that jump to go down, right? You can just force the jump or just go around the corner and wait for that jump to go down naturally and then you can catch them out. So it's not as if Panda Cat feels safe even in lane when he has that leap available. Netroid has the two level advantage, hasn't quite went back for that second relic. But with the Hydra's Lament online, Panda Cat should start cooking here. He's got a little bit more damage if that axe connects. Just because Netroid's auto attacks do more, that ranged poke, that's gonna be benefiting. Panda Cat. He doesn't want to step forward though, because Netroid just feels so confident, has the Desert Fury, and is just ready to 1v1 at really any point in this game. I mean, that's the nature of the on her. I was honestly surprised at how little we had been seeing over the last couple of weeks with how aggressive and how high priority that god was. Haven't been seeing nearly as much, but when it gets into the right hands, it's been looking great for players. Netroid, are you nursing a one level lead? Same with genetics, the entire duel lane up and ahead of the Leviathan side. Meanwhile, you look over to the opposite end of the map, Final K is doing his best to try and keep at bay with SOT. Does go for that final amplifier you were talking about. So instead of seeing the executioner from either of these soul laners, going down two different paths. So far that's the call. And remember the teleport was upgraded a while ago if you're SOT. He's had the option to join left lane at any moment. And Final K I think does the smarter call where you get a halfway. If you see a fight, you back, buy it and go. But has it used all of his gold to upgrade that relic. Finally, we see a bit of a pull adapting is behind Pagon here, forcing him to go back because the Pyromancer is the prize the Leviathans are after. It's the first time you're gonna see Pagon jumping away from the enemy team, but that now buys time for the Warriors on the opposite side. Pyromancer to the Levi's and Gold Fury over to the Oni Warriors. They can continue to push their lead now. 2K up for the Oni Warriors in gold over the Leviathans, still sitting on that 1-1 kill. And that Runic Bomb dropped down by Leviathans nearly takes on that tier one, but it's not quite enough damage. It nearly doesn't count for anything. You don't get some gold for nearly, J-Mac. You gotta take that tier one down fully to help out, which means so far the trade heavily in favor of the Oni Warriors. You'd much rather have the Gold Fury over the, the Pyromancer, unless that Runic Bomb does big things, which you're eventually gonna get that tier one, right? It's close. You could just auto attack it a few times, but not quite available. Level 16 hit for the mid laners, top farm in the game so far. And Pagon going towards this soul gem. This is really just the Tiamat special as far as I'm concerned. Not every mage can use this item well, but when you have a bunch of spam, when you can use those abilities pretty consistently, I think Tiamat just makes so much use out of it. It used to be like Hell and Janus were consistently the mages of the mid laners that wanted to go towards soul gem, but times have changed and you really only see it on Tiamat. Pagon. Get hit by that meatball from Shinto. You're starting to see the damage stack up on the Vulcan. Staff of Mirrodin now online for the opposing mid laner here on the left side of the Leviathans. We'll see what Shinto can get done on this. We'll see if Netro can bail himself out. Gets an impale <laughs> up against Adapting and, well, that's the end of the fight. Adapting throws ult, gets hit back one time, and Pagon dives in. Shinto already no beads available. Goes up the ultimate, but it hits wide. Doesn't find anybody this time. Instead, it's the chip damage from the rest of his abilities that poke down Pagon. I've never seen someone care less about a gank. Netroid did not jump. He stood there and said, what? What are you gonna do? <laughs> Adapting walked forward, impaled him, pushed him away. Finally, this tier one should go down, but Genetics went for the body blocks, forcing Adapting to step forward. That's gonna be that gold. And finally, that investment of going for the Pyromancer over the gold tree ends up paying off just a bit as we see the, the gold go a little bit back towards even. Still though, 16 minutes in, Beacon's about to spawn back. With the objectives down, it's just about who can go in for a, a gank and force relics, but Adapting walked up to Netroid, and he didn't use anything. He, did, he literally just impaled him away and jumped and said, okay, sick gank, bro. Come back in a couple minutes. Let's see if Adapting even decides to go back to that lane. Because it's been a very quiet set out of Adapting in general from the Leviathan. Very uncharacteristic for the jungler of this team. Usually he's the one, once that level five hits, we're going to jump in lane. We're going to throw ultimates time and time again until eventually one of them connects and one of them gets a kill. But He's been very quiet this set. We've seen slow rotations, late rotations, a couple of big moments on the Thor game, but on the Hunbats, didn't really get too many opportunities, and on this Nemesis has mostly just kind of been to scare the Warriors away from invading a buff. And it's not as if the Nemesis doesn't get better as the game goes. That's surely true, but you would think the Leviathans would want to play a bit more to their comp strength, right? This is the point 
where Uller and Ron, like, when Panda Count and Rongyu should be able to combo together and just half held people around the map, just pull down relics. But so far, both hunters have just been AFK in lane. Jump attempt, but not enough to send Panaton to the sky. He's just going to take this shield buff. He has the Anvil of Dawn, though. He was thinking about using it way back. He stopped his back. Maybe he'll go in for something. The Tier 1 seemed to be the call, with Panda Cat leaping away. No more aggression towards the left side of the map. And that was definitely the smart call. If you see Netroid get that aggressive at the tower line, you better believe Thor's nearby. Yeah, I know something's up. When Netroid's that far back normally and then decides he wants to walk forward. So with that Tier 1 tower, the Oni Warriors continue to nurse themselves about a 500 gold lead, still relatively even at this stage of the game. I mean, we're... One to one, 18 minutes in the game. No teams really making a push towards going for any major objective. We had one Pyro, one Gold Fury traded out earlier, and that went great for the Warriors. They were able to nurse up about a 2,000 lead in the Gold Department, but outside of that, there's been a whole lot of non-fighting. It's been, I'm gonna throw an ultimate. Okay, the team fight's done. I missed my ultimate, let's move forward. How quick did the last game end? Like 23 minutes or so? It was, it was fast. I don't yeah. even think Titans got to spawn out. Right. We are at that point of the game where the Oni Warriors were able to go in for a Titan Siege. And it doesn't look anything close to that at the moment, but that's just how quickly a game like this with so much on the line could break out. Pyromancer has spawned in. Wrong you. Forced to Undying Love just because of a Riptide. And the Pyromancer is still being bounced back and forth. Pulled back by the Warriors. Axe Toss on Sot. Good damage from Panda Cap, but even better from Pagon in return. Over There's the wall, the, the river's rebuke. And it's a Riptide to catch out Shinto. He's used all of his resources to bail himself out, but he gets stunned out. And the dunk from Panatom was waiting for Shinto, but he erases Panatom on landing. He can't backfire far enough away from Pagon and Sot. Final K, Sun out in the middle, but wrong you. Panda Cap, their health bars are low. That and now in. one is gone, wrong you. Off of the map, adapting low. And he and Panda Cap have to run back to the tower. Pagon just out of range, but Sot. Might not want to give up this chase. He doesn't have an ultimate, but he'll for sure make the Leviathan. He got it! If you stand too close, Blink over the wall, Sot picks up a third. You cannot lazy back under the tower. The Oni Warriors will not quit, and SOT lands the sickle. That's going to be a big win for the Warriors. They haven't grabbed the Pyromancer just yet, but my goodness, I was amazed. Shinto was in such a bad position and still ends up turning a kill. Panatom lands right in the middle of the Earthshaker, and he regretted that ult immediately. Pyromancer pulled, but the only war is an asteroid. Beads gets him away, but he can't be chased down. Adapting to no his best. The slow is there from the pillar to make sure he's got the distance to get out. The only warriors rally together to get their hunter out. Backing inside the jungle, a bit risky, but wow. just enough presence from the rest of the Warriors to get him away. He just got a first-class explanation as why you should never lazy back, but with Genetic nearby, he had the defense. The Leviathans will finally grab that Pyromancer, the prize they were looking for. But with Sot teleporting back in, okay, I thought there was going to be a little bit more action there. Finally, action dies down. Oni Fury did spawn in. That was a while ago. Still available on the left side of the map, but beautiful plays all around. And Pagon, first one to hit level 20. That's a big deal, right? This Tiamat's already difficult to kill, and more often than not, alternate timeline has been that pickup. With both relics down, Pagon would love a second life here. Oni Fury up. Uh, thought Jax and Sot were beelining that direction. Maybe try and work on that objective since there's nothing else but the fire giant up for the two teams to go towards. Leviathans are very well aware of the risk the only warriors are willing to take around fire giant. Pull the objective, just force a team or try and find a pick, but it's the Leviathans who started up first. There's just enough Oni oh. Warriors nearby, though, and that's going to scare the Leviathans away. Yeah, they didn't have that relics either. Final K really wants to have that frenzy up before you go in for a play like that. Earthshaker and the Runic Bomb would have been some pretty good confirmation, but the Oni Warriors could have said, okay, go ahead. We will ignore the Fire Giant, and we will look for the fight because Shinto has no relics. His beads and Aegis are down for 23 seconds. A risky play to be said, but doesn't mean Pagon feels confident either. He needs those relics back up as well. So this one looks like it's gonna stall out for the time being. Gotta give shots out to Netroid as well. I forgot, that man just jumped in so confidently last fight. Feeling, when you have it on her, you wanna be able to make plays like that, right? You wanna be able to leap in aggressively, hit the impale and sort of create space for your team. I don't wanna see these aggressive hunters play back, right? You, you might as well be playing Jingwei if that's the case. Just play farm till late game and then get your crit online, etc. You gotta be getting aggressive, and that's exactly what the duo lane of the Oni Warriors love to do. And all of that sparks from a banger ultimate from Genetics. You gotta keep your eyes on the Phantom Shell. Wrong you has been holding it well. It's gonna be one of those ultimates that just breaks the game wide open, and Genetics is just the support to hit that ultimate. He's given this team almost a, a breath of fresh air, a new level of confidence to make these kind of plays that you wouldn't expect from the Warriors. You look all the way back on phase one, 
This is a team that's just going to walk at you and fight the entire game, and they're going to do better. They're oh, going to yeah. hit their buttons way better. But ever since Genetics joins this team, they become a bit more objective-minded. They become a bit more aware of situations around the map. I say that, all of that gassing up right now, and Panatom's ignoring the fact that Fury is being done. Now spots out by getting that Ward Vision. Fury down to a quarter and stopped right away. The Oni Warriors regroup around the left side. And that's just smart. Panatom's got ears, right? He goes, wait a second, I don't hear Uller auto attacks. I hear Nemesis and Amaterasu. That means this is going down slowly. I'm, instead of just stepping forward and going in for a steal, I'm gonna get vision for my team. I'm gonna go for those oracles because this is just gonna go down way slowly. Now, Vegan spawns in. The Titans are going to be unleashed. And having a Titan on your side during a siege can be absolutely game-changing. The Oni Warrior is still in a little bit of a better state map-wise, but the Runic Bomb on Final K's shoulders is going to be very impactful as well. I wouldn't be surprised if we saw just a grouping up and just delete the Titans and go back to the Fire Giant Dance, J-Mac. you got to remember what is on the line here. The Oni Warriors, one game away, one Titan kill away from just sending themselves to the World Finals. And the Leviathans need to get something going. If they want to start this reverse sweep, they need to get some action here. It's all got to start right here. Oh, nearly 24 minutes in the game. Titan's about to spawn up and head down left, but it looks like both teams might just like to ignore this. You have Final K on the left side. He can deal with that one no problem. And in fact, he might just go ahead and solo the only Fury, but as soon as that notification goes off, the Warriors will know that there's no Final K nearby. Panda Cat Close. able to get away. Riptide just avoided. And Rivers Rebuke down on the side of the Oni Warriors. Final K is about to reveal himself on the map once this Fury goes down. He's at about 10% HP, and that might just be the go button for the Warriors. And that was, you know, ice cold from Final K, right? He says, wait a second, I see Rivers Rebuke. I see Panda Cat ult out or jump out. But he felt confident. He said, you know what? You're going to live. I trust my ADC. I trust my support to peel for him. I'm going to stay on this Fury. Ends up getting it, and so far hasn't left. Looks like channeling the teleport does show up, but Wrong Yu takes a lot of damage. Oh, no, Wrong Yu, he's got to use the Phantom the Shell because there's too many walls blocking his way. Riptide's another wall that he's got to try and deal with. He's just being poked at by Pagon, who jumps in aggressively yet again. This time it's only on top of Fine OK, but the Oni Warriors playing with confidence in their team fight. Even without Rivers Rebuke, they're willing to make these plays, and Wrong Yu, you can't step that far forward. SOT takes him down, set up by Panasonic, who's in the sky, on top of Fine OK, Sun down. The Vulcan Ultimate doesn't get any damage. Shito walled off, Aegis down, double taps good. Pagon eliminates him, it's three left on the Leviathan. And you have to back up here. The Leviathans have nothing to do. They cannot defend, it's only adapting. That's nearby. Oni Warriors have some low health bars, but do feel confident. They've got their Bracer and they have the Yamoja healing. The Fire Giant is the play. Sot on zone duty, trying to keep adapting away and fine. Okay, he's got movement speed. He might be able to get here, but it's going down fast. He's moving fast, but he's got to move just a little bit faster. Not in time. The Oni Warriors get Fire Giant on all five in the first significant gold lead of the game. 5,000 up for the Oni Warriors team and everybody heading back to base, spending up that gold in pocket in level 20s on the horizon for some. Starter items being finished up for just about everyone now on the Oni Warriors side of the map. The Leviathans are playing in a major deficit now. And that's what I was talking about, J-Mac. Sure, Genetics whiffs the first ultimate, doesn't get much value, but what do the Leviathans do while that cooldown's down? Not much, right? It doesn't really matter if Rivers Rebuke is down, if Genetics is just gonna get it all done with just Riptides alone. Was able to pull back in Wrong Yu, start off that engagement, and of course, Shinto, when he lost those beads, Panatom went to the sky immediately. He knew how to find that Vulcan, and actually, the wall after the fact was the really clutch play that ends up finding the kill. Fine, okay. We'll go for a little bit of split push. He has a Runic Bomb, but has elected not to drop it just yet. In fact, is holding on to it, maybe, for a Fire Giant later on as the rest of the Oni Warriors pushing down left. They want this tier two tower, but the Leviathans, they're not positioned as a team that wants to give this up for free. They're positioned as a team that wants to go for at least a soft defense here. Well, solo laners aren't really here to do a whole lot. They're just boxing each other over on the right side of the map. Fine, okay. Drops his Runic Bomb. That's enough to help him nearly take down that tier two. While the solos are distracted, wrong you in danger. Pagon, he jumps too far for it. He's finally been punished for
for his sins, and Shinto gets stunned out by Panatom. Rivers Rebuke used just to bail out the Thor, but Pagon finally taken down, adapting, slicing ice on three. Panatom beads, hammer away, Riptide to bail out the squad, but adapting's gonna bleak forward, try and dash, but how much can you chase genetics? It's so hard to close the gap on the Emoja. Beads down from Netroid, the Leviathans aren't giving up the chase. Yeah, the Bracer and the Riptide should be enough, and SOT shows up just to make sure the Leviathans cannot chase. But wow, they got the tier two tower. They were able to trade. Final K got the job done on the right side of the map, but the Phoenix Siege is going to be shut down here finally. Pagon goes just a little bit too far forward and does get punished for it. You still have Fire Giant on four. You still have two minutes to go. And because of that, you think that's enough to stop the Oni Warriors' confidence? No. They're going to group up and they're going to continue to push with this FG or at the very least look towards that Pyromancer that's spawning in here shortly. Get that reposition, the regroup. Everybody is back up and ready to fight once more. Pagon has respawned, the only one without the Fire Giant buff. But the Leviathans make a strong defense, showing the Warriors that they are down, but they are not out yet. You can't step too far forward, and Pagon might have finally gotten the heat check that was necessary to keep himself in line. And I don't think that registered. I really don't think the Oni Warriors are any less confident than they've been all game. We've seen them make plays like that time and time again now. Grouping up towards the Oni Fury, this one should, or the Primal Fury rather, this one should go down for relative free, but the Leviathans on the other side are gonna set up for that Pyromancer. This Runic Bomb could be a bit more impactful. Remember, Shinto still has the best burst damage on the map, had a Runic Bomb in tow, and that just helps out. But with Relics available, Pagon still sitting on those beads down for another minute, and Netroid, remember, he ended up beading the slow from adapting, so his beads are gonna be down for a minute and a half, just a little bit longer. The only Warriors might just want to play this one safe, right? Enhanced Fire Giant's going to spawn in here shortly, and you just wait for your engage. It's been a wall from Panatom or a Riptide from Genetics, and that can still happen. The Leviathans haven't had too many opportunities to engage themselves. They've just sort of been sitting back and waiting for the Oni Warriors to misplay. It's only about 30 seconds left on this Fire Giant buff, so the Oni Warriors take their time, regroup back. Tons of wards in pocket sentries for almost everybody just to be dropped down and make sure that the Oni Warriors have vision around the entire side of their jungle and inside of that Fire Giant pit. This might be one of the most crucial defenses the Leviathans can have this game around Enhanced Fire Giant. The Oni Warriors are so confident with regular Fire Giant and the Leviathans simply cannot give up this objective, and they might just have to give up some pressure. Panda Cat and Wrong You in a bit of danger. Riptide gets yet another undying love from Wrong You. And that was just the Riptide. There was no ultimate use there. Pagon used his little slow, but that's going to be back up any time now. Get a little bit more ward coverage. Asat trying to zone the Leviathans, but look at this adapting. Has a bit of a wrap around, and Panda Cat wants to get some poke down. Fine, okay, half HP. Teleport was used to get to this fight, so now he doesn't have it for the return back. He'll be able to resustain, no problem, with the helps of that Death's Embrace. But now it's time for the Leviathans to go on defense because look at the Oni Warriors. They're giving up defense around the Fire Giant. They're just going straight up the right side of the map to the Tier 2. Yeah, they've got the Lizards from Tiamat. SOT playing zone duty. He knows Shinto's close by. He might even blink in here. Why not? Shinto's so close. And Sot does go for the blink. The Vulcan's the target. Anatom on the way. Hammer going to be avoided by Shinto as he uses the beads. 165 seconds till the Relic is back up for the mid laner. A third of his HP already off of the map. And Sot's not done. He's wrapping on the backside. Adapting. Gets spotted out by Sot. And Sot will just go for that 1v1 trade. He's fine expending his life bar just to keep the Leviathans away from the tower. It's going to be a good wall. A Panatom sees the opportunity, but fine, okay, leading the charge, so no more aggression coming your way. Amaterasu is not the target that the Oni Warriors are after. You said it beads down for 140 seconds here from Shinto. He's going to have to watch that positioning, especially if he wants to get in range to steal a Fire Giant. That's not the call. The Oni Warriors will take their Tier 2 tower and head on back to base. Notably, Beads fully upgraded for Pagon, by the way. Wants to get those online as quickly as possible. He wants to be able to jump in. And both of these mid laners holding on to their alternate timeline. So it's not as if you can just burst them down. Even if Shinto connects a massive ultimate, there should be just a little bit of reset time as the Oni Warriors are still the aggressors. J-Mac, there hasn't been an aggressive play from the Leviathans yet. They've been re-engaging, right? They are waiting for the Oni Warriors to make a mistake. But so far, we've only seen one. Feels like the last time we saw the Leviathans get aggressive was when adapting ulted Panatom at like level six over on the right side of the map by Solo Lane. 
And since then, we haven't really gotten to see much offense from Leviathans. And then another opportunity and chance over on the left where Nedroid 180 throws an impale, and that's the end of that rotation. Need to see a big step up here for the Atlantis Leviathans against the Warriors. Their backs are against the wall. The Oni Warriors have plenty of time and plenty of pressure to play with against this Leviathans team. They I only like need one more game to send themselves to the Grand Finals. The Fire Giant's been started up. Pagon already starting to put some heavy poke towards Final K and the Leviathans for Final K. He can re-sustain that on his own. It's getting so weak already, but you can tell the Oni Warriors want to oh, fight. No. He was stuck behind a wall, has to use the Phantom Shell, but just barely the Riptide, but Panacat gets stuck. Jumps over, but now it's Panatom in the sky. He ducks on top of three. Shito, Angus has been used. He's got the timeline, but that's not enough to buy him an extra life. Panatom takes him down, adapting versus three, and he takes out one. Netroid has fallen down, but adapting immediately after. Panatom with three, Pagon with one, and it's only Final K and Panda Cat left alive. What a beautiful Thorold. You couldn't draw a better engagement. And now the Oni Warriors sieging forward. SOT has the teleport, and they've got healing from genetics. Final K and Panda Cat, the only ones who can sort some sort of defense. No, and they can't. Final K's no, they poked. can't. Final K stuck behind the wall. He dashes away, but look at how much damage the Oni Warriors took in their push. They can't go back and try and fight this Titan. So for the moment, the Leviathans live, but they've lost so so much in the process. Maybe they don't go back yet. The Panatom, ultimate. he's going back to the sky. Jumps right on top of Panacap. The full combo takes it. It may be a new team, but the dream is still alive for Genetics and the squad. They'll back away for now and recuperate. That poke, that kill should have been enough, though. The Oni Warriors will have Netroid back up in four seconds. They're going to have 50 seconds without this Uller to deal with. Panacat is not going to be here for the Enhanced Fire Giant, not to mention the bird goes down, Jay. Mac, the fire minions are going to be pushing up right all the while. SOT able to chop through the pyromancer, at least get set up for it. The Leviathans, they have two options. Do so they sit back and play it safe? I think that's the correct call without Panda Cat. Their siege doesn't look as clean. Sop plus Panatom has been an absolute havoc to deal with for the Leviathans, and now they've got to walk up to fire once again. Wrong Yu has been the one caught out nearly every single time by these walls. And Final K once again being poked out by the Warriors, but the Fire Giant is what's the real prize for the Oni Warriors. It's down to 40%. They're gonna commit to it. Instead, it's the rest of the Oni Warriors zoning out the Leviathans. It'll be enhanced Fire Giant around all five of the Oni Warriors. SOT steps forward, though. He's not done. He's chopping away on the sheet, so has to juke the ultimate, and he does. Goes right over it, and even with the Undying Love, it doesn't get him out of danger. Pagon knocks down one. Genetics takes out his enemy support, and Fine, okay, buying any time that he can, but there's just not enough time in the world. The Leviathans, it's up to Panda Cat to defend against five, the only Warriors. They make one change halfway through the year, and that's the change they need. They're going to the SWC Grand Finals. 3-0, the Oni Warriors did not waver for a second. What a beautiful game played by the Oni Warriors. The Tiamat looks so clean. Panatom on the Thor, three-man dunk to make sure that Fire Giant goes cleanly for him. Doesn't get any better than this. You can see the hype on their faces, and they are going to the World Finals. The gatekeeper to Worlds is SOT. Unfortunate end of the road now for the Atlantis Leviathans. It's the Oni Warriors in a 3-0 shutout. And this was a set that was expected to go the distance, or at the bare minimum, to go for. But the Oni Warriors, they bring it together, and they just outright dominate the competition. And that's the thing. You got to be the team that plays your best on the day, and the Oni Warriors have no problem. It's like a switch. They can just turn it on whenever they would like, and they look disgusting in this game. You said it yourself, man. It was the dive. And I'm going to throw Pagan in the mix as the dive as well. It was not just oh, Sot Panatom. When you look around, you're like, wait, where's Tiamat? Is he sitting by with Netroid? No, Pagon was also diving underneath the Phoenix. It was a three-dive composition, and it was disgusting. Got to give credit to Genetics as well. The Riptides broke those fights wide open, forced out the Undying Loves, and at, at points, forced out the Phantom Shell before River's Rebuke even came up. And that was the problem that they were running into on the Leviathans, is that Wrong Yu's getting accidentally caught out. And we say caught out inside the jungle, but it's one wall yep. from 
one Panatom that slows him out. Now he's got to use Undying Love to get away. One Riptide that pulls that ultimate out, and all of a sudden, you've lost your damage immunity, you've lost that CC immunity, and you've lost the second chance that you have to staying alive in these big fights. And now, we look forward. We look towards the finals. That is going to be. We have our two teams, and my goodness, did both of them play fantastic today. The finals have been locked in. It's the J Dragons, and now the Oni Warriors in a 3-0 to go to the SWC Grand Finals. And who else but Panatom stands by with Kelly for our post-game interview on the main stage. Thank you so much, everyone. Please make some noise for Panatom here and the Oni Warriors. Panatom, first question, how does it feel knowing that you're going to the Grand Finals tomorrow? It feels great. I'm really happy to be playing with my team. Um, I don't know, that's it. <laughs> I mean, simple, easy, and that definitely seemed to be your gameplay today. You guys had a simple strategy going into it, and clearly that dominated 3-0. What do you think was the key factor to being so dominating today? Uh, I don't want to be mean, but it was kind of jungle diff, I will say. All right, well, the confidence is there today, but tomorrow you are going up against the Jade Dragons. Do you feel just as confident in that matchup? Uh, no, I feel like the Jade Dragons are a really good team. I will not re disrespect Lazra, but uh, we're going to try to play our own game. And Panatom, real quick, is there anything that you would like to say to your fans here right now watching you? Can I do it in Spanish? Muchas gracias por todo el apoyo. Quiero agradecer a mi novia y a mi mamá. Muchas gracias por todo. Y a todos ustedes. Thank you so much, Panatom, everyone. One last time, please. Some noise, and let's head on back to the desk. Such a soft-spoken, kind-hearted human being in real life, and then a cold-blooded killer in the battleground. Panatom on the Thor, my fellow analysts. Looked near, <laughs> you weren't a fan of that one, Miff? Uh, looks near unbeatable here in, in game number three. Yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't <laughs> want to be disrespectful either, but a bit of a jungle diff, if I, if I could say so. I mean, you guys always say I'm lying about the jungle diff, so may, maybe the, the support player and the hazer have a different opinion. No, <laughs> no, <laughs> no. I felt like I was yeah. watching Ymir out there with those walls. How was, was he placing them like that? He was trapping them in, he was forcing Phantom. I feel like genetics didn't even have to force it with the Yamojo. Unbelievable by Panatom. Yeah, I'm thinking about the Undying Loves that I kept seeing get forced. You mentioned the, uh, the Phantom Shells. The utility just felt on cooldown constantly. Game three, it's over. And the Steel Series Moments of Glory will walk us through how we got there. Inbound, what'd you see? I mean, it just seemed like the Oni Warriors were firing on all cylinders today. Dual lane, their 2v2s were fantastic. Their core 3v3 in that middle part of the game, fantastic. You go late, and they're playing around their comp perfectly. They're playing against this Levi's comp perfectly. Very rarely did you see in the game a big misstep, especially in the second and third game, by this Oni Warriors comp. And I think this is why we saw that change from Jake to genetics. It's when you get to that late game, you know exactly what your job is and you know exactly when you're going to need to do it. And it's those comms in the late game that really make the big difference. It was that play right there when yep. I said to myself, I'm gonna come to the desk and talk about the jungle diff. Unfortunately, yep. Panatom in the interview beats me to it, but plays like that just individually, absolutely decimating team fights. It's, it's that X factor that Panatom's always brought. I mean, I've been a massive fan of him since he's been in the SPL. He's, he's proven that he belongs here, man. Yeah, and Genetics actually said, I spoke to him about it when he wanted to change teams, when he talked about this roster change from Kings to Warriors. He said, I want to play with Panatom. I think Panatom is the best jungler in the league, and I want to play with him. And I think Panatom has just paid back all that confidence Genetics put into him and more. But speaking of Genetics, we can't ignore him. He also has a lights out performance. Yep. Apologies okay. to all the Smite fans, all the Twitter fans, all that. Ooh, I know genetics. I'm feeding into the Genetics propaganda. He, he's got the massive ego, but it's not unfounded with performances like this. <laughs> And, I mean, there's plenty of players to touch on, but, I mean, lastly, I have to touch on the Osiris play by Solo or Troll. What space that he provided for his entire team, the damage he was able to output, and the abilities he was able to soak up, everything about this Osiris play is what you scream out when you see, Os when you see Solo or Troll play him, and you're like, how is he able to do this? And then there wasn't those, those mental lapses that you sometimes see with Solo. He was completely locked in, not just this game, but all week. Yeah, and we talked about the, the, the comp that the Levi's had. It was made to kind of 
kill a single frontliner. It had a lot of single target CC and it locked them down. And because of that, SOT doesn't go this Deathwalker build we've been seeing. He goes full tank, a lot of mitigation, ends it off with a Toxic Blade, and he is unkillable in the frontline. An amazing single frontliner performance by the solo laner. Top damage, or not, excuse me, not top damage, but immense damage regardless of going all defense as well. I mean, 30,000 out of the solo lane, yep. that's ridiculous. And then there were two. And it's wow. the Jade Dragons and the Oni Warriors. Had a nice three game set on day number one, a five game reverse sweep earlier on today. That put the Jade Dragons in the grand finals. And then a 3-0 for the Oni Warriors over the Leviathans. Set our final matchup. Don't want to let it fly under the radar. Another win for genetics here means, what was it 12 straight wins before? Now 13, 13. straight wins for genetics That's on the world right. stage. If you go back to last year, still undefeated this year. We'll see what happens up against the Jade Dragons tomorrow. Uh, we'll have a post day desk here in a little bit. Uh, but I want to get some early thoughts. Now that the grand final matchup is set, Hazer, what's the initial gut reaction to what we'll be seeing tomorrow? I feel like we're going to hear a lot of cheering for the Jade Dragons uh -huh. tomorrow. It kind of feels like good guys versus bad guys, with genetics being the, the main bad guy. Uh, but I'm feeling only warriors. Understood. Inbound, early thoughts? Uh, I mean, the solo lane matchup is what I have my eyes on. I'm so excited to see Nika and Solar Troll duke it out. Osiris, Bologna, the exciting warriors that we get to witness. I'm, I'm gonna say dragons. Myth, round us out. I disagree with Hazer. I don't think we're gonna hear a lot of dragons <laughs> cheering. There won't be many opportunities. I'm going warriors Ooh. all the way. I mean, the jungle matchup alone, I, I just feel like Panatom's gonna run circles on them. I appreciate you guys calling your, your outcome. I just meant, what are you thinking about the matchup? Oh, it's it's gonna really be fun, cool, but and you should watch it. I appreciate sure. the, uh, the early predictions. Both teams going into the grand finals on a three game win streak. I will add Jay Dragons three straight and a reverse sweep. Oni Warriors get it done a bit more cleanly. That is it for this portion of our show. If you're here or at home and you want just a little bit more breakdown, stick around the post day show coming up next. As many products as you can, good luck. Three, okay. two, one, go. Is it? No. <gasps> oh, oh, oh my god. Please, 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 please. Oh, oh. No, it's not that's crazy. fine. Yeah. I'll take that, I'll take that, honestly. Oh, oh. no. Oh. 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 <laughs> oh. 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 Oh, Surely. Oh, oh, oh my god. No. Wait, what? No oh, shot. Oh, I got Yes, oh, come on. No oh, oh, my god. I mean, I'll take it. 30 seconds, right. Uh, oh. No. Can I just, I'm just going to click it right here and see what happens. I there's some stuff down there. Oh, my god. Oh, come on. Oh, no, it like, dang it. I need something, I need something. Yes, yes, yes! <laughs> so clutch. Stream room. Okay, this one here. Yeah, but I'm gonna try and, I'm gonna try and do some advanced tech here. Mm -hmm. Spin it a little bit. Ah, it's not worked. Uh, yep, that's what. Oh. Oh. oh, bollocks. Oh. Have I got time for one more? Am I good from the side? <sighs> Oh. No, I've moved oh. it. Oh, oh, no. I'm out of the How do I put money in? <laughs> <laughs>